Hello folks and welcome to our game, myself Shane Stevenson, joined as ever by Michael Verney, big weekend of GA coming again, like uh, to be fair a couple of weeks ago we were pretty much buzzing for the All-Ireland Football quarterfinals, really let us down, but the semi-finals wouldn't do it to us as well would they? Well maybe we built the quarterfinals up too much, maybe there's less hype around this weekend and they'll you know, deliver a bit of a surprise to us and maybe there'll be a big shock or maybe they There'll be two epics, um, obviously two kind of very, very strong favourites on paper, but you know games aren't won on paper, so hopefully there'll be plenty of intrigue and plenty of drama. We got, what did we get in the quarterfinals? We just be one out of four kind of delivered, um, and that maybe wasn't on quality, it was more on drama, but hopefully we'll get plenty of both uh, between Saturday and Sunday. And the Talchin Cup final thrown in there uh, for good measure as well, which is a tricky enough game to call too. Um, so yeah, hopefully we get a couple of decent games. Uh, yeah, we've got Kieran Carey coming up in the show as well. We're going to be doing a bit of a hurler of the year shortlist with him. Myself and Michael there are going to pick our early all stars. Um, with uh, Kieran also, we're going to do a bit of an All Ireland lead in. What's it like that week or week and a half heading into an All Ireland? Uh, we're going to talk about plenty of other things as well, ranking the top four goalkeepers of those left. And thirty six and counting says, "Be great to see a Monaghan Derry final, but it might just set football back years." Such would be the negativity on show. P.S. Verney, just a reminder the Twitter message I sent you on Monday after the show. Not really sure what that's about. Um, I can tell you what that's about. So in the 2022 season in review, um, I don't know what the conversation was exactly, but I went back and looked at it and it was like, basically, you have committed to wear a black and amber Kilkenny jersey into the Tipperary County final if Tip, if Kilkenny win the 2023 All-Ireland Senior Hurling Championship. And this is a fact because I went back and looked at the clip and you actually agreed to it. Just like I agreed to uh, get, a, get a mullet or a mohawk if Offaly won the under 20. So you've agreed to it in principle uh, a year ago. You didn't think it would happen and now it's one step away from happening. So if it does happen... You're gonna to have to know on you're from Upper Church Drum Band or something like that going into the county final. Come on, Upper Church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Tom O'Keen has given his predictions already. He says Dublin 125, Monaghan 16, Kerry 116, Derry 15. That's probably along the lines of how a lot of people are talking at the moment. People are expecting the dubs to win comfortably enough, and that Kerry will just edge out Derry, but it'll be a bit more of a low scoring game. Um, definitely worth talking about is Willie Maher has been confirmed as the leash manager next year. Um, obviously, th- this year was his first year. Probably would have liked to go a little bit uh, further in the Joe McDonough Cup. Didn't get to the final. But maybe there's an element of a year to get your feet under the table. Now let's see what you can really do in 2024. Yeah, uh, they definitely would have been like disappointed they weren't in around the final stages. Even just getting to get to the final kind of... Uh, with the way it is at the moment, even even if you're beaten, you get a fair flavour of where you're at when you play that preliminary quarter final as Offaly got earlier on this year. It was a realistic flavour of, of where they're at. Um, and I know Willie was disgruntled over the, the last round of fixtures and feeling maybe that, that Offaly didn't exactly help them out in their, in their quest to get through to the final. So I'm sure they'll be out to right a few wrongs uh, next year. As well as that, Mick, Mickey Graham has gone from Cavan as well. Um, five years with Cavan provided well, him and David Power now are both gone after both kind of leading leading Tip and Cavan to the promised land on that same day. Was it November? Yeah, was it November 11? No, I, I think, think it was, yeah, I think yeah, it was yeah. November 11. Uh, one of the great, one of the great GA days. An unbelievable day. And Brian Dowling has stepped away from the Kenny Kamogi uh, set up as well after I think five years. I think he has two All-Irelands there as well. So it's kind of now... Um, to be a lot of lads either being confirmed for next year or lads kind of walking away from next year. So even though we're kind of winding down towards the end of the inter-county season, there's a hell of a lot of things going on here and how you're going to go next year, um, a lot will depend on what your business, what business you do over the next couple of months, what players you get on board, what management team you get on board, what coach you get on board as well. So um, although it'll quieten down in the county season um, from you know the end of July onwards, 
it's a very, very busy time still. What do you reckon will be the, the appetite for some team, whether it's club, county, whatever, to get somebody like Brian Dowling, who's you know done really well with Kilkenny in Camogie. They had lost three All-Ireland finals in a row when he took over, and then he took them to the promised land. You know, like, do you think a county team would go with him, or would there be some snobbishness uh, because it was Camogie? You know, because, like, you would imagine there are those attitudes in some places. Uh, I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have thought so. Um, he's been heavily involved with Lockton's with a lot of their underage teams. I think he managed to win a minor that maybe Mikey Butler might have been involved in as well. Um, I'd see probably a high end club, uh, or if he doesn't say involved with his own club, either a high end club, um, or something like that. I'd say we'll probably go after him, and maybe a Kilkenny underage setup, be it minors, twenties, or been involved maybe there somewhere as well. Get a get a kind of flavour into that, but uh, I don't think he'll be idle. If he wants to be busy, I think he'll be. I think he'll be kept p- pretty busy. Funny enough, Shane, I'm just speaking about about busyness. Uh, I was chatting to Mickey Donnelly yesterday, who's a down selector, and he was just chatting about Conor Laverty, and it got me thinking: like, is there a busier man? Um, full full stop. Like he just he just gave a kind of flavour of uh you know, some of the things that he's actually doing. And he just said about Laverty, he just said, there's a wee bit of magic with him. There's no point in saying any different. He's a very impressive man. It's no secret that he's very busy. He's a busy man. Jesus, he has his fingers in a lot of pies. He's playing club football with Kilku. He's a successful sheep farmer. He has a house full of cubs, so he's five boys at home. He's a couple of coffee trucks on the road. Uh, he's a busy guy, but his passion and desire for football, I've never seen anything like it. As well as that, he's the down under 20 manager. He's the down senior manager. He's still playing with Kilku to a really, really high level. And he's all this other stuff going on. Um, they often say, if you want something done, ask a busy person. Um, they don't get much busier than that now. Nicky Donnelly actually said that Navarty could probably still play if the situation was different. He could probably still play with Down or off or something if he said if, uh, if him or Marty Clark maybe took the reins instead of him. But maybe that might be a bridge too far to be player manager or something as well. But just a phenomenal... Phenomenal to be able to, to balance all that. And I think the, the way he does it with the kids, Mickey was saying, is he br- generally brings them all to train, <laughs> brings them all to train. And so that's probably a bit, of dad, a bit of daddy time there as well and exposing them to a, a county setup and just getting them kicking balls back and stuff like that. Sure, what else are you going to do with them? You have to just bring them in there. I remember bumping into him, oh, she's, I'm not sure, it was a few years ago now. I was just walking in around town going in through Trinity and there he was. He was a GA officer in there. Mm. I'm not sure if he has any link up with them anymore, but uh, he did. He'd gone from either having the massive beard to no beard or the other way around. And he said hello, and I didn't even recognize him for a minute. And I had to be like, what? <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, very impressive indeed. Uh, a few more comments coming in. Uh, Tom O'Keen says, the all-star goalkeeper, Owen Murphy saved versus Claire. I mean, we are going to come back to that. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, Shane, in your opinion, who will be the hurler of the year? Conor Whelan, TJ Reid, Aaron Galan. We'll come back to that again in a few minutes. but uh, might leave, We might leave that for Kieran. Uh, yeah, where, to... where do you want to start here? Will, will we talk about how it's a big country for old men? And we often hear about it's no country for old men. But the amount of old lads that are, you know, in relative terms, that are lining out this weekend is quite impressive. Now, viewers out there, who's the greatest old lad in GA history, at inter-county level, and then in club level as well, if you want. But the key thing is why, what moment. Mikey, do you want to go through some of the names of the players? Yeah, it's it's phenomenal, really, because we're kind of told now, probably 32 or 33, and that's it, you know, at county level. And listen, I, I don't think we're particularly guilty of it, but a lot of people are guilty of once a fella hits 30 and plays a bad game, he's like, is he coming back next year? Is this his last year? There's an awful lot of pressure on I know Patrick Horgan was talking about that recently, but like looking at the teams that are playing this weekend, so uh, with, with Monaghan, you have the Hughes brothers, uh, Kieran and Darren, both well in their, their mid fifties. Carol O'Connell is thirty five. Right. Mid-50s, sorry, mid thirties. Apologies. Uh, Carol O'Connell, he's ever so slightly uh, older than Manzi, who's st- <laughs> who's still absolutely flying with Man and obviously coming in off the bench. Christy McCaig is thirty four today, I believe, and he's going to have a big job ahead of him at the weekend. James McCarthy, similar. Um, I think he's thirty three. Mick Fitzsimons is thirty five. Cluxton is in his forties. Dean Rock is early thirties as well, and maybe edging towards the to, toward towards the exit door. But there's some of the key players there. Like you're like I kind of find it amusing at times, even in club setups. That oh, get the young lads through, get the young lads through, and it's, that's great. Don't get me wrong. In you need you know a good conveyor belt of young fellas coming through. 
but what like what are they without you know an old head showing them the way really a lot of the time and like a, a young lad that's a real good forward real good on the ball what is he without an alpha that doing all the cute stuff to create space for him and maybe hand him out the ball and I'm not saying it's like that at county level because you can't just plant the lad centre forward and say we're going to lob ball down on top of you and that's all you do it's different at county level you have to be still mobile in that but that's a fair list of guys that are still I'd say excelling like they're not surviving at county level generally the vast vast majority of them are excelling and they're going to all have a massive say in who gets through to the all Ireland football final at the weekend and you know actually in terms of like having older lads still playing on on uh, teams like it's learning by osmosis for the lads around them like you can't tell a young lad you know what he should be doing you know yeah. just you know in the cold light of day it's kind of you have to nearly show them when you're out on the field or as they do something wrong, you're explaining exactly like in mid flow, whereas it's very different afterwards. Do you remember that moment when you did whatever and whatever, you know, so having that person beside you, even showing you the example of how it should be done, that sort of stuff is important. So sometimes you see a load of out lads are shoved out the door at one go and then who's replacing them because you're asking the young lads to not only be the players playing on the wings, but the leaders in the center. And sometimes I think that's a little bit short sighted, but if let's say, so of those four teams, if five substitutes, and I know you can use six, but if five substitutes were used in for each team this weekend, you'd have 80 players playing. We've named 10 lads there who are probably all 33 and more. And in some cases, maybe even, well, 41 in the case of Stephen Cluxton. So one eighth of the players, over just over 12%, could be players that are serious veterans. And I think that's very, very impressive. Oh, God, it is. More yeah, than team like. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, what you what you were saying there is, yeah, like, see all the the lads Desi Farrell has brought through. Just say, like, the likes of would say Key Murphy or Darren Newcomb or these boys. Just say they were coming through, and McCarthy had gone, and Cluxton wasn't there, and Rock was gone. Like, their learning curve is very very sharp. Like, you're mm. learning. You're you're really really been thrown in at the deep end. Whereas when you have lads kind of guiding you through games almost and that's the way it is it's almost like it's maybe it's not like that at county level but definitely like that at club level where you know a more experienced player is near nearly taking you by the hand and showing you exactly what to do in certain situations and it's funny you say that um it's one thing saying to a lad from the sideline oh when you why didn't you do this when you were there it's a different story when if you're on the pitch with him you can actually say it to him there and then and they, they get it. I think they get it an awful lot quicker um, because you're out on the pitch and you can see an awful lot more when you're out on the pitch as well. I love playing, playing senior B with burnout at the moment. There's lads playing, what's this young lad came on the other day that was 17, like half my age. And you're just you know, you're just trying to give them anything that you've learned down through the years. Now, it, 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 no more than when we were young lads, you don't pick it all up straight away. And sometimes you have to have to go through your own experiences to get to that point where the penny kind of drops or whatever. But you do learn bits and pieces. You learn maybe how to survive, how to protect yourself, that type of thing. I love nothing more than actually when an, an older fella on the opposition team maybe picks on one of the young fellas because mm. he thinks he can get him. And he's just, I don't know, I, I, there's probably nothing I take more umbrage with than, than that. I just, I don't know, I'd, ne I'd never go start on a young fella on the other team and see him as weaker on like that. I'd start maybe with one, a, a lad me old, at my own age and maybe round around in the ground with him. But there's nothing like it and you, you'd go into them straight away and you'd have them by, have them by the scruff of the neck because it's, it's I don't know, it's not that it's sacrilege, but it's, it's sacrilege as a player to see a young fella been bullied or manhandled yeah. or someone I trying to manhandle him. Oh, it is. 100% it is, yeah. And we, we probably all know different players that, that do it. It's But it definitely wouldn't be something I'd like. And it's uh, it's something that I take fairly great offence to now. And uh, you, you were telling me just before the show that you were bearing down on goal the other day. Did you show the young lads <laughs> how to finish? Well, it's like this. It's great. It's like uh, someone, someone said it to me after. It's great, like, talking on this show. Oh, he should have hit the ball into the ground. Or he should have done whatever. Kieran, I was just saying to Shane off air, I got a ball through from centre forward the other day about 35 yards out, and I just had a head up the steam. And I'd kind of beaten the centre back, and you know I'm a corner back by trade, and my eyes were my eyes were lighting up. I knew exactly where I wanted to put the ball. I had it all in my head. I was coming down the left the left post, and I was going to hit it bouncing into the right corner. And sure, I ended up miss hitting the ball over the bar. Never, never even it got within an arse's roar of the ground. I was looking to get a score out of it, but it's funny talking. You can talk 
you can talk and talk about what lads should do, but when you're actually out there in the white heat championship and you actually have to go and do it, it's a little bit different now. Me and Shane are a bit different than you, Kieran. You were you were able to go and do it in the white heat championship the whole time, in fairness to you. Yeah. <laughs> Come here, at least, at least, Mike, you raised the flag. That's the most important one. There you go, yeah. At least I made the umpire make a little gesture down to his right or left. Yeah, there you go. Kieran, we were, we were talking there about like when you're an older player that uh, you try and almost coach young lads on the field and that kind of helps bring them on. Is there any player that when you first came on the scene that here was a veteran lad who took you under the wing and while you were out on the pitch, he sort of helped develop you or have you done that in subsequent years? Oh, without a doubt. And I suppose I would have been very lucky, Shane, when I started my career, I was kind of going on. I was involved with Patrick Swell and Frankie Nolan. Now, Limerick last on Ireland in 73. So Frankie Nolan was involved in that. Leonard Inright was playing. Uh, David Punch was playing. Sean Foley was playing. They were all in their late 30s and 40s. So, you know, it was a fairly humble experience to go into the dressing room with all of these guys. Yeah, and, and thankfully I knew my place. You know, I would have been quiet. I would have been learning my trade, saying nothing. But, you know, you know Frankie Nolan uh, definitely would have put me under his wing. Leonard Inright, I started off in goals and he would have been full back. So he would have also put, him, put me on brought me under his wing for all of that, for, for, for that whole period while I was in goals. Yeah, and I would have been extremely mindful myself, whether it was with Limerick or Patrick Swell, anyone that was new or anyone that was struggling, I, will, I would have always had a little whisper in their ear. And, you know, that just went with the territory for me. And I suppose that's what I've seen. That's what I experienced. And, you know, that's what I tended to give away as a player. Was it the sort of stuff whereby they'd give you tips on how to play a certain position or more or less telling you, don't worry about this lad coming in here, I'll protect you? What sort of stuff are we talking about? Yeah, I, I can remember playing a city final, my first city final inside in goals. You know, my first two puck outs went out about 35 yards. Sort of manager Phil Binnis roared in, hi Phil, you take the next one. And you know, walk back to me. I'll be twice as bad, he said to Miss Fortune. You know, but like, they, they, they just had a way of kind of making it comfortable and easing your way into it. Now, Shane, I was only got soon at the time. I was only 17 years of age, you know, and I was going in there with men. So I had a good few of them coming at me, but I do remember Leonard Inright, you know, really kind of making it comfortable for me. And, you know, as, as Mike said there, when he's given the example, when he's on the ball up front, you know, it, it's all about, in my opinion, I suppose, you know, being composed, not allowing your emotions, I suppose, to kind of, dictate your play because if your emotions are at play then you tend to kind of play a bit nervous, make a few extra mistakes and but you know, bottom line, if you're a bit composed, you know, nine times out of ten, when you're composed and you usually empty the tank even if you're underperforming, good things will always happen. And Kieran, another thing is, is, are there any moments that stick with you personally? Like Vernie's there talking about skewing a ball over the bar when he was close to goal and he was in. Are there any moments like that that still stick with you where, you where you were like in a certain position to do something and, you know, it went completely awry on you? <laughs> I tried to, tried to think now. I suppose it might have, it might have been, there's one that sticks out now, right, to be fair. And it might have been scoring. You know, I used to get a great kind of kick from, believe it or not, I suppose creating scores more than getting scores. You know, I got a kick from that. Even though I would have got a few points, but I got just a great kick of kind of making a score, creating a score. Yeah, one particular incident does, and I was after getting the bed belt in, into the, in here to the eye. Uh, I was just kind of late in the tackle, and I mistimed it, missed his hurley, and he followed through, and the pole of the hurley caught me here. Needless to say, Shane, it never happened to me again. <laughs> uh, Michael, I was just said about uh, that incident stuck with you from last week. Are there any incidents in bigger games where, you're, where you had a moment and that moment sticks with you because maybe you could have done something different? Well, uh, the time we got the scutcheon from John Milan definitely would, uh, would, def would definitely stick but out. That, that, that was 25 minutes of pain. I'm talking about a single moment. Um... There's nothing. There's nothing jumping out at the minute. I'll probably think of something in a minute. I just wanted to throw something to Kieran about the wheel turning. Then, um, when you went back to play intermediate with Limerick, you were the experienced kind of codger, and you were the one. I remember you saying to me, 
you were the one that was kind of getting on the ball and you made a bit of an all-star our our Tom, our Tom Condon by all accounts. And <laughs> Tom has no problem in saying that he probably got called into the Limerick squad as a result of that. But you were playing full back. You were doing the simple stuff. You were giving him the ball and he was kind of clearing the ball up the field and giving it the big one or whatever. But that's kind of the way the wheel turns, isn't it? When you're, when you're the young fella, the old fella is doing the hard yards and letting you and giving you the ball and saying, go on, open up the legs. Then the wheel turns, you're winning the ball and you're letting the young fella do the hard yards and you're maybe doing the smart stuff, if you get me. Yeah, you, you bang on and you're right. And, and Richie McCarthy, Richie McCarthy might have been the other cornerback for a while too. And funny enough, when you're going into a kind of scene like that and you've gone through the Limerick seniors, you know, I was cutely aware now, right, to be humble and there's no big shots here. And I kind of made a decision to kind of keep that quiet and most of the talk, and I probably did, would have done it with the hurling on the field with the Lions. And exactly what you said there, kept it nice and simple, but it was a little flick out to Tom Condon or Richie McCarthy without saying it, away you go to his years now. And it's uh, funny as well um, how the wheel turns. When you were the 17-year-old, the old fellas within the club are probably collecting you or bringing you to a match when you're, you know, just say you're going playing fucking Sarsfields from Cork or something like that in a challenge game they're collecting you the wheel turns you end up in your 30s you're collecting the old fellas it's amazing that's kind of like the circle the yeah. club almost isn't it yeah it is and, and that's the beauty about the GA uh, Mike and Shane you know it's always about it's always about repetition repetition and in respect of you know whatever county you're with you know everything starts and everything finishes with your club and there's a question here from Richard Hogan, and this was about your assist. Did Kieran provide the assist for Damon Quigley's goal in 1994? I'm fairly sure he did. Off the left hand side, I think. I, Shane, I, I don't know. It's just kind of a blackout to me. <laughs> I'm fairly sure he did. That was a brilliant goal, wasn't it? That no, was to be fair, my memory, my memory there. I think, I think Damon came away. Damon came away at about two four or two five, and I don't want to be too hard on him here now, but he could have probably got about four eight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's another question saying who's the oldest fella you ever uh, met on the field the oldest fella the oldest fella I would have ever met in the field yeah uh, the oldest fella possibly possibly I think there was a fella sent a forward for a ward for one time Chunky O'Connor he was calling him he was kind of a big kind of a Gonzella kind of a block just trying in there to kind of upset the whole old thing with a pair of shoulders. I think it might have been him. My memory serves me right. But Shane, I, at the end of the yeah. day, as a player, you know, age doesn't even come into it. If you went into County Jersey on it, then, then you're reaching, you've all the credentials ticked. You know, it's inevitable you have it in respect of your age. And looking at the players now even, you know, look at Tony Brown, how long, the longevity of him. Look at Reed, the way he's gone. You know, the modern player, if they mind themselves, look after themselves mentally and physically, you know, provided they've good old genes. Now, not everybody can do it. Someone's legs can go extremely quick. But nine times out of ten, if you mind yourself and look after yourself off the field, you know, you can stay going to a good 35 years of age. That's provided you mind yourself. Just on that, Kieran, your old, uh, your old teammate, Pat Heffernan, is still going strong. I think he's living over. I think he's living over. I think he's living over in the UK. He played. He played a game with his own young fellas there in recent weeks. Um, he talked out. He's fifty three. Um, but that's some going to still be going at that age. And I know you're still playing masters football now as well. But it's great. Like once, if if you can, if you can move at all, you should stay going as long as you can. Of course you should, because come here, there's going to be huge benefits in it for your mentally and physically. Yeah, I saw a clip about Pat and I found him, I had a good chat with him. No, he's based in Mallow, but he, he went over for the match. It oh, he went, over, he went over to play the match? He did, he went over okay. for that himself and his dad. They went over that morning, played the match and came back that night. And, uh, you know, Pat would be huge into that kind of family and would be huge in getting the opportunity playing with his son. So, hi, to the super achievement. And it's pretty rare what he's after doing. Mm. Uh, another thing I wanted to ask you about is Limerick last week. But before we come to that, the week or two before an All-Ireland final, did you squirrel yourself away or did you chat to people in a normal walk around the parish the whole lot? Shane, i kind of been honest with you. I would have went out of my way and all right to stay under the radar as much as I did. Yeah. No, obviously, obviously, though? say it again. Does that make the days very long? Because obviously you want the game to come as quick as possible, but if you're sort of hiding yourself away, does it make the days very long? No, I didn't use the word hiding. You used the word hiding. I mm. said under the radar. I might I'd be bit I'd be a bit like I'd be a bit like Richard Kimball. 
they might spot me one minute and the next thing I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I suppose that, that was a conscious decision, Shane. I suppose now it's extremely difficult. I suppose the big one for the modern player now really is discipline with their phones, you know, because there's no hiding hiding away from that. There's only one way you're going to avoid that, sidestep that. That's if you're disciplined. And I suppose, Shane, yeah, I didn't fully hide away, but I knew exactly where I was going, what type of company might have been there, and what type of stuff could have been said. So I was watching myself. And did it make it long? It didn't really, because it was part of my preparation. Because, you know, I had to get into the zone w without probably, without kind of allowing it to kind of emotionally grab me all the time. But there was times and it did come to the head. And that was the way, that was my build-up. Mm. I always love being busy anyway before a game. I'd always go yeah. farming, farming for a day or something like mm. that without killing yourself or anything like that. I remember uh, very stupidly going to the bog one time two days before a championship game at Offaly and I was hardly able to move when the game came along. <laughs> but uh, it, it's nice to be out and get a fresh air. The last thing you want to be doing is? is sitting around too much or anything like that. Um, oh, big time. To try and stay active, but obviously not too active. And you know, when you're yeah. when you're on the move, and out the country or something like that, you're not really meeting anyone, um, no. but you're kind of keeping the mind fairly active and you're not thinking about the match or anything like that. Yeah, and a lot of people would have been busy back then because, you know, I have a very good friend of mine, he'd be, he'd be very friendly with Padraig Joyce. I'd know Padraig myself, and he'd be constantly coming to my friend at the time. I'd be down in Trelly or Clare, and I'd see Kerry and I'd an event, he'd throw boxes in here and he'd throw boxes in there, the Target Express. So I would have been like Mike, I would have been busy, busy. But then there would have been periods in the night time where I would hit the head and you'd have to keep it in the head. And I suppose... You'd crank it up mentally then. The closer you were coming to the game, the more it would be, obviously, into your head. And that was, Would you that try and avoid it, Kieran? Would you try and avoid that thought about to get, like, completely, like, who you're going to be marking or like that until you kind of have to flip the switch when it comes to the weekend and you really have to start thinking about what... Like, just say there's... I don't know how many weeks there was to an All Ireland final back in the day. It was probably three or four. Like when would you start thinking about the game, or would you would you try and park that to one side completely, and then when it gets to the Friday or the Saturday, really start tuning in on I might be marking this side, he might do X or Y, or what? How would that play out? I suppose the week of the game, uh, Michael, at the start, I suppose it mainly in the night time it used come, but come Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I probably, as the man said, I used kind of think more of it. And I didn't go down the road of thinking of opposition or the player. Uh, if I was fully in tune myself and, and, and I was fit, you know, and, and I was mentally and physically up for the challenge, up for the battle, up for the performance, then the opposition, did for me, didn't come into it or whoever I was marking didn't come into it. It was all about getting me right and probably... Time, trying to time it the best way I could by the time we crossed the white line. Can I just ask you as well, how would you fare now with all the analysis that goes on in a setup? Um, I know, like, I, I don't like analysing things too much when I'm playing myself. If I was a manager, I'd no problem analysing everything else. But I find I would be in my head way too much thinking about X and Y and, oh, I should have got that hook here or whatever. How would you fare now in an inter-county setup where... You know, everything is analysed. There's stats everywhere, and you're looking at your performance. Yet, I found I I'd, I'd overthink very easily. I put it to you that way, and I'd end up not doing myself justice. How do you think you'd fare in a county setup now, where the level of detail is so fine? I yeah, I, I'd say I'd fit in, Michael, like a glove, really, because if you're behind centre back or anywhere around there, you know, okay, it mightn't be as detailed. You still have to do a particular job, right? And 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 I suppose the way I played, I, it was automatic. I used to try to cover left and right. And I suppose it wasn't mentioned, but I suppose looking back at it, I was kind of hurling a sweeper-ish at the time, as well as as well as baby setting 11 at the same time. You know, and I suppose, it, and if, if you're brought up in that culture, you'd slot into it easy. And I suppose if I was molded into it, I'd be absolutely fine with it. The only thing there with all the analysts, the only thing there... You could at times restrict a particular player from probably from probably really igniting on a day. And what were your thoughts then, Kieran, when you saw Limerick beaten Galway 224 to 118 the other day? And the man that was playing at number six, you know, Groot Hegarty had been named number seven, Kyle Hayes ends up playing number six. The the, the team sorry, um uh, Willow Dunne who plays number six, Kyle Hayes goes out in the wing. What was your thoughts on that and how did you think it worked initially? 
I, to be fair, right, I had a fair idea it wasn't going to start like that. I had a fair idea they were all going to come back one and kind of do a semicircle. And that's the way it turned out. Willem went back, Kyle went out, Kyle went back up, uh, David Reedy moved in and Keane went out. No, and I suppose Limerick will get away with that, Shane. And the reason they will get away with that, they're a seasoned, compo- they're a seasoned composed team. It won't upset anyone else. Whereas if you look at the Clare, starting Shane O'Mori, at cornerback, you know, you can start, kind of say to yourself, right, did it work or didn't work? We'll come to that in a minute. But if there's one team that will get away with a few old moves like that in the one in the one motion, for want of a better word, is Limerick because of their experience, because of their composure, and because of, and I suppose ultimately, because of how good they are. Yeah, it's true. And, and like, in terms of how Galway started out so well, and then there was a complete takeover from Limerick, stopped them scoring, well, produced, reduced them to just six points in the final 45 minutes plus injury time. What do you think was the key turning point in the game? I think Limerick were probably like rabbits in the headlights there for a spell. Uh, I think they probably got a bit confused because, uh, oh yeah, Cahill Mannion was usually the man that kind of went back. And from where I was watching it, it appeared to be Con Cannon that was doing an off lot of covering. I felt Galway tactically did everything. It did a lot right in the first half. Their shape. Like I looked down at several occasions, Connor Whelan had acres of space in front of him and outside of him. So Galway were kind of retreating and it suited them. But for some reason or another, okay, and I suppose I always say this, Shane, you know, half time is where most games are won and lost. And half time last weekend was huge for the four teams. Limerick got it right and Kilkenny nailed it. Because Limerick came out in the second half. There was a spell there in the second half, Shane. There was just dullness. There was quietness. And the spectacle was over. For me, the game was over after 10 minutes, second half. And, and I suppose, watching the game, my feeling was if Limerick were going to get a performance against Galway, they had to come up with the best performance this year so far. They did that, but not only did that, but in the second half, they went to a total different level. And I kind of was smiling and saying to myself, yes, the machine is back. <laughs> Do you know, actually, myself and Michael were just talking before, and this could be three years in a row now that you end up with a Patrick Swell, three different Patrick yeah. Swell hurlers making hurler of the year, like Aaron Galland's form. He's just a sniper at this stage, isn't he, Kieran? Oh, sh- w- without a doubt, Shane. But Shane, to be fair now, right, and I don't want to be too hard on Dahi Burke now for that goal, and it was a great goal. Like, Dahi's a season campaigner. He's there a long time. And, you know, I do remember the league game this year, Aaron Galan got a goal against Galway in the Gaelic rounds in the league. A very, very similar goal coming from, from behind, catching it. Like, as a full-back, you have to protect the goalie, you have to mind the square, you have to be strong, you have to be ruthless, you have to be physical. So Aaron actually done Dahi in that particular one. So it was an easy old goal to give away. But to answer your point, Galan is on fire, and he's on fire. For, mainly why he's on fire, Shane, is he's acres of space. No matter cornerback or a fullback in the country, the type of ball that he's getting and the space that he's had, there's no defender that will defend it. Or his or his movement, Kieran. Like his yeah. movement is relentless. People won't see it on TV if they're at the matches. They probably do. And F- Seamus Flanagan's excellent at it as well. But yeah, I the three, the three, three, the three yeah. boys now last week. To be fair, and I know to get the subs around the all did well. You know, Flanagan took took Flanagan a while. After 20 minutes, you could be scratching her head, taking Seamus Flanagan off. Next thing, all of a sudden, bang. So the three of them were excellent. But Galan, to give credit where he's due, Galan has done that from the start of the season to now. Whatever comes at the end of the year is a bonus for him. It's the last thing in his head. But to be fair, I do remember two or three years ago, he was after a very good season. And I was kind of saying, if he's any bit of a good final, he's there with an old chance of picking up Hurler of the Year. I think now as it stands, he has it. It's my own opinion. Uh, just, just on that, Kieran on Galan. By all accounts, he wasn't always that good in the air. Just chatting to various lads from the well. Is that something he really went after himself? Like he's it just to have that ability to be that out ball that no matter what, if you get the ball in around him, no matter what way it comes in, he has a chance of winning. It's some asset to have. But by all accounts, he wasn't always that good in the air. No, but in fairness to him, he would have actually worked extremely hard on that, Mike. You know, and, and I suppose a good inter-county hurler, if you're going to be the full package, I suppose the big areas where you need to look at, where am I weak in my game? 
what else, where other of my skills can I improve? You know, like good hurlers will do that. And you hear it in the premiership soccer players all the time, you know, they're trying to improve, they're trying to prove. Hurling has gone that way too. And in fairness to Aaron Galan, you know, he would have worked extremely hard on his weaknesses. And you're right, would he have been good in the high ball once upon a time? No. But he is he exceptional now in a high ball, without a doubt. It just goes to show if you go after something, how 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 much of an expert there do you become in it if you really oh, go after it? Oh, big time. And I, I can remember, you know, inside in training with Limerick, you know, the boys be slagging, you know, I was nine times out of ten strike and lift into it. Do we always say about your weak side, your weak side? But I would have spent hours on the local field practicing on my weak side. And if I knew that I was good on my right, and I suppose what I used to do was try to stand in one position and hit the ball straight up as high as I could, right? And I believe if anybody can do that with your weak side, then your weak side isn't weak. So, you know, you have to improve. You have to practice where you probably might be that strong. With me, it was my weak side and my so-called weak side. And I suppose like when I got that point so many years ago from the weak side, that put my weak side to bed. I was going to ask you, I'm sure you gave it the big, you, I'm sure you gave it the big one to a few lads after it. during the like during the analysis of the two games of the weekend, and obviously Kilkenny be clear also, there's been a lot of talk about what went on in the sideline. For example, when Nicky Quaid did the old, whether it was he got a tap in the stomach or the usual contact lens trick, which he's done a load of times. So, you know, there might be a, the boy who cried wolf, even if he tries to say it wasn't contact lens this time. But Henry Shefflin seemed to get very emotional on the sideline. You've talked about emotions in the past and keep them cool. And then Brian Lohan, was he cool enough on the sideline, both in terms of like, I suppose he's got a bit of a track record now of making decisions that, you know, are somewhat questionable. But like, he'd certainly be getting quite animated on the sideline. Is that something that's proved decisive there at the weekend? Well, I'd imagine it, 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 has to, it has to play a part, Shane. And, you know, and it's going back to learning from old experienced guys. You know, Phil Binnis would have always said to me, as a kid, hi, Kieran, don't ever forget the coolest man is always going to come out on top, whether that's on the field and off the field. And Shane, all I can do is give my experience of both sides. And I would have been at both sides. And I would have been extremely conscious the day of a match, no matter what type of match, especially if it was a big, a big game, you know, that I had to be at my best and I had to be as composed because if I'm pulled towards the referee or if my hands are flying and if I am roaring, then I am not fully tuned into exactly what's happening around me. And it's different for other people. Some fellow might come on, you know, whether it's Davey or Brian Law, and there must be something in the water, Claire. They might come on and say, you know, that's what gets them going. But for me, everybody will have their own opinion. Like, Derek Ling wasn't hopping around like a gazelle. Like, he was nice, cool, composed. And for me, I think that's the road to go because, you know, you will be seeing them with a clearer set of lenses there. No matter what is going on, there's nothing going to wrap them. You, know, you still see what's happening around you, Shen. Just yeah. on that, Kieran, I think Brian Lowen, like, I, 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 he might correct me on this, but I actually think he got lost in the occasion the other day. Aaron Shanahan, who's one of the most dangerous players off the bench, I think he was actually forgotten about amid the whole I was going, game. I was actually, I was going to make that point, right? Because the one player you don't want to see, well, from a Limerick man coming on with 10, 15 minutes to go was Aaron Shanner. And when I think it might have been two minutes into extra time, I said to myself, by God, and I forgot this trick. My feeling was the same way as you, Mike. Like, and that's what can happen. Whether it whether it's whether it was designed or by mistake, I don't know. But he's a player that you would bring on because he's tall, he's able to grab a ball, get a score, create a score. And actually, as it turns out, he could have made a huge difference if he if he was there for the last ten minutes. Well, if you look at that and you compare Kilkenny subs were like it was n nearly preordained that X was going to come on at this time and it was all regimented and they had everyone in in place. I just couldn't believe that um, with the game in the mental pot with Claire needing a score, that this lad was... He got three minutes. I just thought it was baffling now, I have to say. And I do think it was a, it was emotions maybe getting the better of it. Lads maybe getting sucked into the occasion, whereas, it yeah, it definitely didn't happen with Kilkenny and it's not something that happens with Limerick either. Kylie can be animated at times, but there's a hell of a lot of coolness behind them as oh, well. There's lads, there's lads telling them to, that we need to bring in X or we need to bring Y at this time, you know? Yeah, you're right. I actually felt the exact same. And Shane, another point. I, and I suppose if I got animated on the line, I suppose I just wouldn't stop. 
<laughs> I, I, I continue. My point is, it can be neck for some people, but if I get cross and animated, you know, I find it hard to kind of hold it. <laughs> I could catch someone by the throat. My point is, like, and some people, I, I, I won't mention any names, but some people kind of do it, kind of just show the hands and just put up. But other people then to go a small bit further, you know, and like bottom line here, I believe myself personally, you have to be at your best as a manager on the day. You have to have the ability to see everything. And if you're going to get caught up with roaring and shouting, fourth official, linesman, referee, then you're going to be blinded. Mm. And actually, there's a comment in here. Shanahan is Lohan's club man, I think. Yeah, they're both uh, Wolf Tones. He should have been in there for at least 15 or 20 minutes. Oh, big time. Yeah, Tony Kelly is another one who was quite animated during the game, Kieran. And there was obviously that decision that went, went against him, that high ball around the 45, give or take, against um, Mikey Butler. And there was another time he got really animated and he was in the referee's kind of face as well. So it, it just didn't go for him either. Second year in a row at this stage. No, and, and in fairness, in fairness, Shane, you know, Claire pay now, and they weren't a million miles away from this now. So you can imagine if they got all these small things right, how close they would have been. Because having said all that, they weren't too far away, and they were a bit unlucky. There was a great, I think, Conlon started. There was a great move, and I think it was Shane O'Donnell left it off the last minute as he was slipping. It would have been an outstanding goal. It came from Conlon through all the lines, and uh, I think Shane, as he was falling, he didn't pass. He didn't pass it, but probably could have given it quicker. And, there, and, was, and, and Conor Fogarty came back, dived, blocked it. If they got that whole goal as well, if they got the tactics right, if they kept it cool and stayed focused, you know, they weren't too far away if Shanner came on early. So I think Clare's defeat the weekend, you know, they played a big partner to themselves. Mm, mm, yeah, they Unfortunately. Sort of, yeah. And in, in terms of like um, Limerick, so... Like, is there any player that you kind of felt stood out more than anybody? Anything that from the game that that you'd want to remark on? Yeah, I I, I thought I thought Kyle Hayes in the second half and Burns. I thought that it was as as aggressive as I seen him play in a while, and there was and they were putting down nice little silent markers. I thought the way they've managed Keen Lynch for the last four weeks. Obviously, whatever they did in the four weeks, we saw it the weekend, and you know. I think they managed him brilliant, did well in the first half, but he really came into his own in the second half. I thought our full back line were extremely comp composed in the second half. It was like a training session. So looking at the whole squad, they're at their kind of, they're not too far away from at their best with their second half performance last week. Mm -hmm. Even um, though Nicky Quaid had the whole pile to do, but his experience is absolutely brilliant. Slowing down the game when you're meant to slow it down. And 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 he's doing that and getting no effort. Yeah, just just on that, like I, I don't I think people are kind of um it's obviously a point that's been brought up or whatever, but like as as Eddie Brennan said to me the other day, he said, Don't hate the player, hate the game. If you can get it like if you it, like that's the experience. Like if you if you it can is, get away, James, if you can get away with it. But, but like if, if but it happens again, Kieran now, I think if it happens in the All Ireland final, I think the referee will probably go, No, listen, go off so and we'll put someone else in goals to take the puck out because as, as Shane said there, it's happened a couple of times maybe. It's happened in their last two games. But like it is cuteness. Like how many times did you go down in the game at different stages when when you needed to go down? Or and it's you can't buy that experience as well. No, that's experience, cleverness, and cuteness. And Tidney's fault. Tis actually bottom line is if it's anyone's fault, is the man in black with the whistle. So it's up to him, you know. And as, as Michael said, like if he tries this, I'd imagine if I was a referee, I'd be sprinting in sixty yards, telling him, "Hey, come on, up you go, get on with it, and away you go." So he's From getting away. Yeah, he's clever. Yeah. From what I'm hearing, the the James Owens actually called the doctor in because he got a slap in the chest. Uh, I think it was Brian Kincannon about five minutes before that. Um, so mm. I don't know if it was the the contact lens thing the other day. I think he actually got a slap, and I think the the umpire made James Owens aware of it, and he and he came in. But it's just amazing to see the couple of minutes after, and then all of a sudden Limerick are a completely different Limerick as well. It's it's mad. Yeah, and I. I, oh, I no, no. I still doubt there was that much wrong with him. But um, another thing is, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, emotional responses. And, like, Henry Shefflin's done a lot of good. He's won two club All-Irelands as manager and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just talking about this day in particular. So he's already a bit wound up on the sideline. And then, Kieran, the, is there a bit of cuteness in Willow O'Donoghue to hit him a little half-shoulder on the way past as well? 
maybe just in the hope of winding him up a little bit more. Yeah, possibly. Like, but to be fair, you know, like in fairness to Henry, like I think he probably got the best out of Galway this year in the last two or three games, and that's as and and a touch last year. If he got the same spin that he's getting out of Galway at the very start of the year, there'd be a total different animal. Like on the line, Shane can be the most loneliest place to be at times, and you know, and powerless. There's no more you can do. You know, whereas you have some chance in influencing a situation or a game when you do you've the jersey on. But when you're on the line and I suppose what's supposed to be implemented, what you're supposed to be practicing isn't manifesting on the field, then a bit of frustration is gonna come up with Henry. Because to be fair with Henry, Henry's cool, he's calm usually, you know, it isn't like him to get a bit excited. And I, I would probably say possibly that might have been the driving force behind his frustration because you know what was meant to happen probably didn't manifest in the field mm. uh, Hugh Paddy says Limerick's, Limerick's inside shooting is insane Flanagan throws it up from awful angles over the shoulder if it was anyone else he'd get the curly finger strikes the ball <laughs> above the shoulder and is deadly accurate uh, Detox 101 says whatever you say about Nicky Quaid isn't it an absolute endorsement for bringing back the Mayor Ferna uh, Mike Casey for an all-star this year says Father Paul Stone, the only player to start in All-Ireland for Limerick in the last five years who doesn't have an all-star yet. Jeez, you wouldn't, I hadn't uh, copped that. Obviously, he had injuries there for a long spell as well, Mike. Yeah, he's the only he's the only one, would you believe? Um, and obviously he came off in the came off at the fifty five minutes, I think, of the eighteen final, and he's missed yeah, he's missed a fair whack of action, but he's been really solid this year. Outside of the Tipperary game, I think he's been really solid. And Kieran, that the block from like it was probably the weekend of save slash blocks. Connor Forwardy's block, uh Owen Murphy's save. Mike Casey's block was huge in the context of the game the other day. He just had to hurl out an active hurl. He was probably lucky that it hit off it. But the game, like, Galway could have been eight or nine up at that stage. Maybe we'd be talking about a different game. Maybe they, they would have come back anyway, but it was a huge play. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And, and in fairness to Casey, he knew nothing about it. It was just like they had to rub it to get the green. And you're right. If that went in, because I can remember saying it to Liam Cahill, I said, that is a huge part of the game. That's going to be a huge turning point at Michael Casey. Total accident, which you do get the rubber the green from time to time, and he got it there. I think it's worth noting, all right? David Reedy, I think, he's really after finding his mojo, meaning he really now he appears to be actually comfortable playing at the pace he's playing at. And he now he also, and I, when I'm thinking now how he made the, little, uh, how he made the goal for, Ke- for, for Galen, he now appears to be, uh, I suppose, a regular, and uh, he's going very well too. I think he's worth mentioning as well. To be fair, he'd be starting his first All Ireland final too if, if that really, was, yeah. was the case. Really. Like he'd be mad. And we were only saying the show the other day. He started. He was playing for Kildare in 2017 under one of your former teammates, Joe Quaid. It's amazing how his graph has gone from Christy Ring hurling back then to potentially starting an All Ireland final. What six years there? Yeah, and in fairness, it didn't happen overnight. It was very gradual for him. And he went through a poor old spell because he used to be coming on at times. And uh, take a few wild shots, wide, wide, wide. So eventually, he's after coming. And it's worth noting now as well, you know, Cahill O'Neill would probably start in any other inter-county team in Ireland at his ease. And he's also playing awesome any time he comes in. So that could give you an idea how strong they are in the line. Kieran, I was Googling as you were just talking about that last, uh, the match the other day. Did you say you were watching with Liam Cahill or did, did I mishear you all together? No, you were right. You were on the ball. My, myself, Liam Cahill and Jamesy, we were we were up with BBC Sport. Very good. Well, did yeah. you get any insights there from the season? Were you grilling uh, Liam, you were? Shane, I got a load of information, but I suppose my philosophy <laughs> would be what happens in the mile stays in the mile. <laughs> <laughs> well, did, did you give him your tuppence worth at least? <laughs> I did, yeah. He was great company, but sound. Now, in fairness, Actually, I wouldn't have met him since our playing days. You know, he played Conor Forward. Haven't met him at all. And, uh, you know, we do great two hours. Great two hours. Great company. Yeah, and Jamesy as well. Was he? I presume he was... Was that the day of the Limerick game now or the, the Kilkenny game? The Limerick game. The Limerick and Galway game. Yeah, right. it was good. Yeah, Nice yeah. experience. Good fun. Good, good bit of crack. Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, Actually, I tell, I tell this little story. It's to, to worth, to worth telling. We went in under Crow Park in, in, in by the press area. So I met Jamesy. I said, lovely Jamesy. You're very familiar with this setting, so I'll follow you in case I get lost. So 
we went to NMIS, so I was myself, Jamesy, Liam Cahill, and Joe Kenning. We were chatting there, just underneath the stand and where the, where the buses come in. And Marty, Marty Morris, I spot him to the right. Marty was just edging over, ready for a conversation. And as he was opening his mouth, I just made him my presentation with the keys in my car, Marty. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> good man, good man, good man. <laughs> Did he take it off? <laughs> oh, very good, very good. They're talking great spirit, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff great stuff um so is there anything else like in terms of owen murphy's save how would you how highly would you rank that i'm sure you've seen some brilliant saves over the years yeah uh, brilliant but in fairness to murphy murphy has you know i, I suppose looking at nicky this year not as busy as he usually is and i suppose that's an indication how good his defense is you know but still had a very good year but murphy to me as it stands is a standout goalie outstanding now, he would have been prone to a better puck out, I suppose, in the last few years. He also has looked at that. But the save the other day was absolutely outstanding. He's a super goalkeeper. Actually, to be fair, there's a great keepers there at the moment. And the new keep, temporary goalkeeper, I put him down as outstanding. He's probably, and he's in his infancy in his trade, potentially he's probably the best of them to pick out a player. Because he is like an assassin. It's straight into the hand. There's no going left, there's no going right. He can pluck him out from anywhere. So he's going to be an outstanding goalkeeper. But going back yeah. to Murphy, outstanding, Shane, outstanding. Sir. Played a huge part in, played a huge part in Kilkenny winners as well. I was just going back through some of his other great saves as well. Uh, he saved three or four from Galan in the 2018 quarter final. A couple yeah. of kick shots as well. He's actually one of the main reasons that Limerick potentially aren't going for six in a row as well. Remember David Reedy mm -hmm. broke through at the end of the semi-final in 19. Oh, yeah. He pulled off a great save from him down low. Um, Kieran, any other, what like where does that save rank among the the kind of the pantheon of greats? So looking back, I was going through it the other day. Remember, Davey made a brilliant save from Paul Shelley in 1999 in the Munster semi final. Uh, Joe Quaid made a save with his right hand in the 1996 All Ireland final mm -hmm. from Larry Murphy that was unreal. Damian Martin in the 81 All Ireland actually stopped a point and tipped it around <laughs> the post for a 65 against Galway. Any particular save stand out or you've obviously had great goalies standing behind you at different stages but is there any particular save that it would stand out or you'd measure it up against? Yeah and in fairness Cunningham from Cork now would have made a great save. Poor old Tommy Quaid, Lord of Mercy Soul. You know he was a brilliant shot stopper too. Yeah and, and in fairness to Joe Quaid right, Joe made outstanding saves in, 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 in the few years that he was there. But like I, I suppose Mike, you know, every year you're going to see something that we haven't seen before. That's the beauty about the game. That's the beauty about hurling. And that's the beauty how it's kind of developing and changing. We tend to see something that we haven't seen before. Go back to Shane O'Donnell last week, the flick straight up to Kelly. You know, so, you know, he's worth mentioning. He did an outstanding year as well. He did, he did a super game. Duggan was, was, was extremely good as well in the second half. But, you know, that's the beauty about the game. We're seeing something new all the time, Mike. It is a slight change in direction. Kieran, do you have any interest in the two football matches this weekend, Derry versus Kerry and Dublin versus Bonham? Oh, I would. My, my my grandfather would be from Waterford and Kerry, so I'd always have a little I'd always have a little eye on the Kerry games. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would, I'd go I go to a lot of, I go to a lot of the Kerry matches, Shane. I do, yeah, yeah. So I would, I would big time, yeah. So, you know. Yeah, and come here, I suppose at the end of the day, I suppose looking back at the neutral, are hoping and looking for the Kerry Dublin final. But funny enough, I'm watching Monaghan the last few years. Anytime they overlap Kerry or Dublin, usually in league games, they give them bags of it. So that could be two, two very interesting games. Mm -hmm. And uh, is David Clifford your favourite player to watch, like everyone else almost? Is David Clifford? Yeah, come here. That, that's an ob He's the obvious one. But funny enough, I've serious time for his other brother because when that fella is going, a bit like Bit like Keen Lynch. When Keen Lynch is at full flow, you can be sure Limerick are coming with him. And David Clifford's brother, what's his brother's first name? Sorry. Paddy. 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 When Paddy is motoring well, the whole five other forwards in midfield, it's like a bit of a conveyor belt. They're all automatically playing well. Now, and to be fair to him, I would have seen him on several occasions playing club football uh, well before he'd carry senior jersey. And I'm sitting down, I'm scratching my head, and I'm saying to himself, how come they're not bringing this guy in? You know, so he missed a good number of years of his inter-county inter, inter, inter football career. You know, so thankfully, thankfully, 
no people can see what he's made of. Yeah, but Kerry, I think David, and, David always says the party was a bit of a not a late bloomer, but the, the as they say in horse ter, horsey terms, the penny dropped maybe a bit later that he realised he needed to go off and do a bit more or whatever. But yeah, I, yeah. I agree, I'd agree with you, Kieran. Um, and it's something we're going to talk about later. Who's the most important player for each team when he's humming the ball going inside? to his brother, the ball went inside to Gini. The amount, right. when he's on the front foot, that's why teams, a lot of time, you know, obviously, there's going to be a man marker on Clifford, but like, Connor mm. Myler picked up Paddy Clifford the other day, just to try and shut him down from setting up play, mm. just to try and shut him down from being that kind of assist merchant that he is, but mm. yeah, when the, when he's in full flow, Kerry are a joy to watch, definitely. Oh, without a doubt, yeah, without a doubt. Kieran, would the um the diving that we saw in Hurlan last weekend again, is, is it starting to get in your nerves a little bit? We were talking about how and Limerick weren't the only ones, but Peter Casey, there was three frees in a row that he won in second half, and he, and he fairly sold at least a couple of them. Brian Kincannon went down a bit handy once or twice. Uh, Walter Walsh as well did a big belly flop near the end line when David McInerney came over to him. Like, it just seems to be everywhere in Hurling at this stage. It does, Shane, but at the end of the day, go, going, back to, going back to what we were talking about, Nicky Quaid, whether he's injured or not injured, whether it is good timing or bad timing, he slowed it down and got away with it. That's one side of it. Yeah, it's 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 something I would like to see creeping in. Now, thankfully, the weekend we didn't see too many too many octopuses passes. <laughs> there was no pulling arms of ten hams. There wasn't too much of that. So that was great. And you know, there were spells there. There were two very good games during the periods, like the Clare game and Kilkenny game. There was good standards of hurling through a lot of it. But I'd agree with you. Anybody like anybody who's doing that are kind of partaking in that activity. You know, I suppose in the old days, it would be started out by a player. You can't do that now, right? So it's up One to the referee. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. No, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. But like, you know, you, you don't do that. Like diving. I, I don't think it's shown. I don't think it's shown a great ingredient of your character when you're doing that. You know, I often say your full personality needs to come out in the field. And if that's part of your personality then it wouldn't be a positive thing, in my opinion. You know, anybody throwing themselves down on the ground. Like Shane O'Donnell, to be fair to him, right? He's, you know, he's not the biggest guy. You know, he'd go through a wall. You won't see him doing a Ginola or an Isle on it. Not a hope. If he's taking all of it, he'll be taking all of it. But I think, I think, Shane, inter-county players know themselves who would be inclined to pull a stroke like that. But you're right, it's not, ni- it's not nice looking at it and it isn't good viewing and I would be hoping that it isn't the trend that players are going to do going forward. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, look, uh, I, I think we, we'll tee up the game more specifically next week when we have you back on, Kieran. So we'll, we'll probably keep the rest of the stuff in the chamber for then. So thanks for joining us today. Not a bother. And Body, we have a good day and God bless Body. Cheers, Kieran. Good luck. Okay, so... There's so much to talk about. We'll do our early All-Stars, will we? I think we should, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, actually, do you know what? Before we do that, we might, um, just, just to give me an opportunity to sort of, you know, put together a little page for us to, to put plot them all down, I might play a little bit of a clip from Chrissy McCaig. Since we're talking about some of the veteran players, and I think he's turning 33 today, you were saying. 34 today, yeah. 34 today. That he's going to be marking... Um, David Clifford, and it was the tail end of 2022 where we chatted him about the potential of someday marking David Clifford. So it's uh, this it's is like you know, in one of those kitchen shows. Here's a clip we prepared earlier. Yeah. Can you think of how any scary, other manager? How, yeah. How scary would this be? People <laughs> want to see Clifford v Chrissy. Yeah, it'll be scary. He's. I think he he will go down as the best of all time. Um, scary, scary, scary. But at the same time, I think I think as a player. I've always had this stance throughout my career. I want to go and try myself against the best. Um, now, any 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 defender that's saying that David Clifford wouldn't be an unbelievably hard and scary task, but ultimately, as a player, you want to say when you finish playing, you played against the best. You tested yourself against the best, and um, I wouldn't be the first player that David Clifford's got the better of. So, what I have to lose. Yeah, your your former Derry hurling teammate uh, Nisha Waldron says, "What's the story of the Schlock Neil boy?" I think that's enough for that uh, particular tip. We've kind of changed the uh, topic very swiftly there. But, yeah, like, he's got the right attitude. What do you have to lose? He does, yeah. And, um, like, listen, that duel is going to go a hell of a long way to deciding, potentially, um, what way that semi-final goes. And even if, 
if Conor McCluskey ends up on Clifford at some stage, uh, Clifford got the four goals off him, the four four he got off him in the minor final was off Conor McCluskey. And I'd imagine McCluskey has probably waited for a day where he gets a, a rap of Clifford in a, in another big game and it's going to be in Crow Park again if they, if they do meet. So I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the two of them uh, are, you know, marking each other at some stage on uh, on Sunday. Are you sure Conor McCluskey has been waiting for this or dreading it? Ah, well, his, his performances in recent years would suggest that he's uh, he's fairly tried from that minor game. That could that could totally hang over a fella. Um, and he's his form has gone the other way. I would say he she was in the reckoning for an all star last year, and he's probably in the reckoning this year. Uh no, I think I think it's something that it probably it probably you know ate him up for a while, and maybe it would affect his form and his confidence for a while. But I'm sure his performances. Uh, in recent years, would suggest he's well over it, and I'd say he'd love another crack at Clifford just to see. Like that was at minor. Clifford was nearly a full, fully grown man at minor. Conor McCluskey wasn't, so I'm sure he'd like another go at it, uh, on the biggest, nearly the second biggest stage of them all. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, uh, I'm just about to bring up the the image here with the All Stars. So um, I suppose you should just get us started there in the conversation while I'm doing it. Is there is there anyone in in goals? I think that's standing out pretty obvious. Yeah. Away. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd say there's probably three in the running realistically. Um, Owen Murphy after his heroics the other day, and even before that, um, I thought Nicky Quaid was outstanding in the Munster final this year. I thought it was as good as game as he's had for for Limerick, and I'd say. Even though he didn't start their first game, I'd say Aver Culligan is probably in the mix for a nominee anyway, uh, given the saves he pulled off uh, the other day. And uh, yeah, having not started the first championship match, I thought he was very good thereafter. So I'd say it's probably um, one of Quaid, uh, one of Quaid, Murphy or Quilligan. But at the moment, you'd have to say Murphy, the, the balance is probably tipped in favour uh, of, Owen, of Owen Murphy. Um, now, saying that, you know, you know, a decent bit will come down to the All Ireland final. I would say Limerick went after Murphy's puck out fairly hard in last year's All Ireland final, and there was times in the first half um, where he found it really, really difficult to get the ball away and get the ball to the destination. So, um, but he's in he's in pole position. He's probably going to be tested a fair bit in the final too. You'd say so. He's definitely in. Uh, he's firmly the number one at the moment, anyway. Yeah. So then, like in terms of the the cornerbacks, Mikey Butler, of course. I, th I think we can nearly chalk. Final again? You, would you be okay with that? Sorry, I lost, I lost, I lost you there for a second. But uh, yeah, M Mikey Butler's definitely in pole position again. I think his duel with be it Peter Casey or maybe potentially Aaron Gillan in in the All Ireland final is going to be fascinating. But his his form has not dropped. Uh, the goal in the Leinster final, the runs forward in the semi final the last day, putting Tony Kelly on the back foot. Like it's really difficult. Um, as a player like that, he his first inter county season last year, he picks up an all star, young herder of the year, plays in the All Ireland final, keeps Tony Kelly quiet. It's really difficult to back that up. Yeah. But he's he's made a fair effort at it. And I remember Paul Murphy's first five years with with Kilkenny, I think he won all stars. He won all stars the year they won all Ireland. He won all star 11, 12. They took a break in 13. He won again 14, 15. Butler's come in and make and it made an instant impact like that again. So to me, yeah, I think he's in definitely a pole position for that number two shirt. Now, my Casey would be a million miles away. Um, and he's I think he's been really, really consistent this year as well. And um, Adam Hogan would be, you know, in the mix as well. And I know it was very difficult for all the, the defenders for Clare the other day, but he'd have to be in the conversation. I think Darren Marcy's had a pretty good year for Galway. Um, a couple of the Dublin defenders have done all right too, but like I, I think by dint of conceding so much against Clare, um, it would be very difficult to make a case for putting in a Dublin defender in there. Is there anyone from any of the other counties? I think Mark Fitzgerald had a good year for Watford, despite, you know, sometimes at the back they were a little bit open. Um, who would you be looking at for the other cornerback spot? Are we eventually going to end up with... Uh, well, two, Dan, look, are we going to end up with two? Yeah, we're going to end up with two full backs. No, um, three no, I don't think we can do that. Wow, but then we're going to be leaving you. Then we're going to have to leave either Hugh Lawler or Dan Marcy off the team. Yeah. So who's? Uh, I think you can only do that if there's an outstanding cornerback to put in their place. I don't think Barry Nash has been good this year. Don't think he's been at the levels he was last year where he was nominated uh, for hurler of the year. Teams have um, pushed up on him more, haven't they? Yeah, they have. They've not allowed him to uh, 
I suppose maybe the secret is out a small bit and teams are not allowing him to, to take on the ball maybe like he did in other years. I just thought Dan Morris, he was outstanding last Saturday night. He's just that kind of silent assassin in defence. He always delivers. Um, like when was the last time you really saw him in trouble in a game? Uh, particularly in around full-back. I think full-back is probably his best spot. He's a very good wing-back. He's obviously an all-star wing-back as well from 18. I just think, think he's so solid there. Um yeah, like listen. Hugh Lawler about... brilliant. He has been absolutely brilliant, and you know he he very much won the battle against Conor Whelan earlier in the year, and then so much so that Conor Whelan moved out to the half forward line for when they met in the Leinster final. Like he's been very really good, but I think Dan Morrissey ha- has game on game been up against tougher tougher opposition because Munster is tougher, and he was excellent the other day. Um, so for me, it's got to be Dan Morrissey. And I don't think that we can kind of do the cop out of picking two fullbacks here. Well, the only thing is, it, it, it's a, it's not a cop out if we have an outstanding cornerback to put in there instead <laughs> of them. Um, I, I think it's, if you're picking, I think if you're picking two fullbacks over, you know, if Sean Finn was in the reckoning here and you're picking between Sean Finn and Mikey Butler for one corner, and then you're putting two fullbacks in at three and four, I think then we have an issue. But if there's, if they give me the outstanding cornerback, like we put Mike Casey cornerback. Well, I don't. I certainly don't think he's played at Hugh Lawler's level, even though he's been very good. But uh, I mean, this is the thing, though. Like, are, are we going to take the cop out of saying, well, you generally have two man full back lines, so maybe you can get away with having two full backs? Would you be Would you be happy as a manager to have both Dan Morrissey and Hugh Lawler as a two man full back line? Yeah, this is the thing. Like, yeah, they're. Like you, you want someone who's a bit quicker on the ground, even though neither of them really get done for pace. But yeah, they don't normally fit the profile of two fullbacks you'd have. They normally fit the exact same profile of one of the two you'd have. Yeah, so you could send Mikey as the well. You could maybe send Mikey as you probably have Mikey and one of them inside. Um, I I personally don't think it's I don't think it's a cop out in this instance because I don't think there's an obvious omission. And I think I put it to you this way. Lucky is probably not the right word, but I think someone someone would be getting an all star a cornerback in our list here that maybe you know is not that they're not fully deserving, but like if we're leaving out an out and out cornerback, I've no issue. We go with the, we go at the full back and we won't put two we won't put two full backs in three and four. But I don't think that's the case. Maybe maybe that'll change. Maybe Barry Nash will have an outstanding final and we'll have an obvious second de facto cornerback he's, he's not de facto cornerback either but uh, you know what, you know what I mean I think if we're leaving out someone obvious I've no issue I've no issue there remember 95 uh, Lo- Brian Lowen got like this was a bit mad now because Brian Lowen got the fullback at three and Kevin Keenan got the all-star uh, cornerback and he never played cornerback in his life and you wouldn't play him cornerback but I think I think there's a bit, good bit more flexibility with those two boys yeah I like being honest I think we do have to pick the two of them here but by by picking Morrissey at three and uh, Lawler at four, I think we're slightly acknowledging that we think that Morrissey has been more impressive so far. And that's not to do down Lawler. He's been brilliant, but it's just the quality of opponents that Morrissey has come up against. I think if you were, if you were sending, I think you could send you Lawler as a, tra- as a tracker. And, like He could easily float around anywhere there, as you saw with his point the other day. So I'd, I'd have no issue there. If it was Mikey Butler and Dan Morrissey inside as a two-man, no problem. If you had to send Hugh Lawler out, he's played centre-back this year for Kilkenny as well. He can play centre-back, wing-back. He can play a corner-back if he had to, and he can definitely play a full-back too. Um, before we go too much further, of the teams that have been knocked out a while ago at this stage, you know, your Tips, your Corks, your, uh, your Waterfords, your... Uh, Wexfords, Dublins, Antrim, Westmead, so on and so forth. Is there any player that we should be talking about for this before we get too deep into it? Because we'll just end up forgetting about them. I'm just thinking from a temporary point of view. <clears throat> um, probably, to be honest with you, on the, the nominees for the keeper, Reece Shelley would probably come into <clears throat> the conversation, um, to yeah. be fair. Um, as regards other players... Jake Morris, maybe, even though he's very quiet the last day. So, you know, that was. Yeah, really I was kind of thinking when Tipperary were beaten whether whether he would get a nominee or not. Yeah. Uh, because if you were looking at midway through the Munster Championship, you're thinking definitely he's going. He's definitely going to be in the mix here. Maybe not now. Alan Tynan, you would have been saying maybe at different stages in Munster that he would have been in the mix. Probably was a bit quiet maybe thereafter, I would say. I know Mara at stages. At stages, but, you know. I don't, I don't know if he would come into that kind of mix. Cork were obviously eliminated early. Um, 
Hatch Gordon had a brilliant season, you'd have to say. Um, dispelling any questions about whether he should come back or not, or whether he's over the top or anything like that. Far from it. He's he's shown that he's absolutely flying as, as well as he ever was. So, he, will he get an star nominee? Yeah, Kieran Joyce, solid again, very solid at centre back. Again, I don't know whether either of those will, will get nominees at the when it when you know in the heel of the hunt, as you'd say yourself, just because it's so stacked towards the the final two and to a lesser extent the final four. But those those few definitely deserve uh, a mention. From a Dublin point of view, would anybody Donald stand Burke. out? Donald Burke had he not come off, you know, after whatever it was eight minutes or whatever against uh, against Clare, he'd probably be maybe in the conversation for an odd star, but he probably will get a nominee, I'd say, at the end of it. Yeah, probably not too many others. Wexford, I don't know if anybody really kind of blew me away from Wexford this year because they were just a bit disappointing. Um, Waterford, I kind of mentioned Mark Fitzgerald. I don't know, would I be mentioning too many others, really? Would you? Patrick Fitzgerald, like if he played more games, he'd be in probably mm. the hurt, young herder of the year conversation, maybe. But um, by the fact that he only started one championship game, he'd probably... You know, he probably won't be in that conversation realistically. But he's definitely a player we're going to be talking a hell of a lot about over the next couple of years. Yeah, Dara Egerton, according to SSRI, was very consistent cornerback for Westmead year. This year, their best player overall, nearly. Conal Cunning, uh, very good, says Grode Howley for Antrim. OK, so coming back to the All-Star selection here, will we just throw in a few Limerick names here almost straight away? Like Kyle Hayes is definitely getting in here left wing back, I would imagine. Yeah, to be honest with you, like our Burns and Hayes both kind of nailed on at the moment. Burns yeah. had two, two men of the matches uh, throughout the Munster campaign, and when things weren't going that well, he was probably one of the ones that was flying high. Uh, Hayes was really good during Munster, and he was outstanding in the second half the other day. Um, he probably maybe took his form to another level even the other day, and that little scoop pass or that little scoop point over the bar, Kieran was talking there about coolness under pressure. Like that was just so cool. A lot of other lads would have panicked. He was going to be hooked. If he struck the ball any other way, he was probably going to be hooked. So, um, yeah, it, that's worrying from a Kilkenny point of view that he's carrying that sort of form into the All-Ireland final. And I wonder, though, does David Blanchfield come into conversation here? Because he's really impressed me, I have to say. Yeah, um, he's, got, he's going to be one of the most important players uh, in the final, you'd imagine, because he's probably going to be detailed on one of those big kind of marquee half-forwards um, he, he comes into the conversation all right. Um, I, do, I don't think he's been at the level of the players we picked at five or seven yet. Maybe a big final performance, and he, and he, and he might come into it. Um, center back one is an interesting one. Like, you're John you Conlon's. Your well, I tell you what, like, he, he, there's not too many more. Kilkenny, like Richie Reid has not played that much this year. David Blanchfield has been in centre back at different stages. He's probably David Blanchfield probably has a good bit of credit in the bank at the moment, but you couldn't put him in as your probably number six. Will have done who played his first ever game at six for Limerick the other day. Declan Hands missed a fair bit of action. You'd imagine it's going to be very, very difficult for him to be in the mix. Um Condon obviously is definitely in the mix. He missed a bit of time obviously coming off the day against Clare. And uh, Galway, like Dottie Burke played six for most of the year, then he played full back against Limerick. So, like, John Conlon's probably the only obvious number six, is he, at the moment? It is John Conlon. Maybe you could make a push for Kieran Joyce, but it feels like Cork have been out for about six oh, months. Oh, he'd be making a big push now, in fairness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Rumours that Blanchfield is injured for the finals is 36 and counting. We'll see. Hugh Paddy, I assume that Dermot Burns of Carlo at uh, five, yeah. See, no, see Dermot the... Burns. You leave all, yeah, you leave yeah, all yeah, yeah. that famous point at the end of the John McDonald final that broke our hearts. We're pretty happy with this team so far, aren't we? Yeah, it's just going to be interesting. Um, if we're Crack Dunham, the laughing at John Conlon here, I don't know why because he's excellent. If Willow Dun if Willow Dunn who starts the All Ireland final at six and goes very very well, he could yet edge Conlon out. See, the thing about this is I don't know who has a fair bit of credit in the bank from his midfield uh, games earlier on this year, particularly. When Limerick, when Limerick were struggling, like are you, are you putting, are you putting Will O'Donoghue in middle of the field? Is is Will O'Donoghue a midfield all star at the moment? Darrow Donovan definitely is anyway, because he's in the hurler the year conversation at the minute. Okay, so let's get that in there straight away, and um, we'll we'll talk about who are the options for midfield. Um, is there anybody that you'd look at from Galway and say they're a midfield option? Um, I thought Sean Lalan had a very good season, McCall. Yeah. 
yeah. Uh, whether he's whether he's in that mix. Um, he wasn't Gareth. always midfield though. He was wing back against um, Limerick. Yeah, he was. Uh, Lennon, he, I wouldn't consider him a midfielder. Injured for a lot of the year, played in the forwards and kind of as a sweeper. Um, the Kilkenny options again, like they've, it's been a movable feast there. You know, yeah, so hasn't been the same player all the time. No, no, that, that's anyone in Kilkenny tell you that's their big kind of worry. Um, going into the All Ireland final Colin in particular, Malone? Colin Malone was Colin Malone was good probably until until Sunday. He probably had a really good year until Sunday. I say realistically, and he drops out there a fair bit. David Fitzgerald is going to be high up in this conversation, isn't he? I just see him as a straight up wing forward based on how Clare play. Okay. Um I don't know who's probably I don't know like the thing is, I don't know who if he plays centre back in the All Ireland final. Can we pick a fella midfield that's probably going to play centre back? Um you see, I, I still think if Hannon's right, he's gonna play and I don't know who will return to midfield. So I think this is a little bit of a tricky one for us, but just while we're weighing it up, Adrian Mullen from midfield. I, again, he's had injuries, um, but his comeback the other day, and I know he doesn't necessarily sit there midfield all the time, but he, he is fairly much in around that middle area all the time. Yeah, he's usually in around the middle third. Um, he obviously, what did he miss? The only, he played, what, 20 something minutes against Wexford, missed the Leinster final. Uh, he'd have to have a fair final now. But mm. he, he, if he hits three or four, you know, a lot of a lot of how Kilkenny will get on the honor of final will come down to him and his fitness and whether like he was very good the other day considering the amount of time he's missed. I think he was seven weeks out. If he is a big final, Kilkenny have a big chance. I don't think he's in don't think you could say he's an all star at the minute though. I think he's gonna to have to be close to man the match in the honor of final to, to get that. And do you think like has O'Donoghue had a big enough year to to like forget about him playing centre back the other day? Like has he had a big enough year to be a midfielder? Oh, God, I think so, yeah. I think when Limerick was struggling, he was one of the war dogs that was pulling them through games. Um, now, I, I look back at the Munster final again recently, and I say he was a happy man um, that that free wasn't given at the end to Clare because he he went through on goal and got hooked really, really tamely, and the ball went wide, and the result of the puck out nearly ended up in a Clare free. But I think against Tip, he was outstanding, against Cork as well. No, I'd, I'd have no issue uh, having O'Donoghue in there. Um, but Hugh Paddy mentioned Ryan Taylor. Had he not come off the other day? He, yeah, he was in the mix. The only thing, now I think his confidence was down a small bit from the even looking back at the Clare game. He missed a couple of chances in the Munster final. In the Dublin game, he kind of didn't really want to take on shots from from what I could see. Um, I think I think I don't know who's got a fair bit more credit in the bank now than than maybe Ryan Taylor. Yeah, and I've thrown him in there. So, geez, this is looking fairly Limerick heavy. Well, it's like have this: already... Limerick haven't been going that well, and we already they hadn't been going well until the All Ireland semi final, and we still have five. We still have five Limerick players. We've already got them, gone through one to nine. Yeah, Groad Howley says Paddy Deegan, but I suppose you could say he's played in the half backs as well. I don't know if you'd necessarily say. And I mean, fair enough, Will O'Donoghue who didn't play midfield the last day, but I just think you'd have to give it to Will O'Donoghue and Dara Donovan in this situation. Uh, wing forward then. So, like David Fitzgerald is in the mix here. Um, Kevin Cooney's been quite good this year as well. And I know he's played inside a lot, but he's often wearing the number 12 and he does come out. His set, his set up for Mannion the other day was gorgeous, wasn't it? Just yeah. lovely. Like, you don't see that type of a pass now. It was bounced on the ground to him through a couple of bodies. Absolutely beautiful. He had a, he had a very, very good season. Um, and he's, you know, the likes of him, and probably Sean Lalanne, Ronan Glenn and Darren Morrissey, Jack Grealish are kind of bright spots for, for Galway, even though they end of the year and they're very, very disappointed not. I've made an executive decision there. Yeah, it was just a matter of where he went with putting Shane O'Donnell in. Um, yeah. he, even the other day again, just when things weren't going well for Clare, like he's just, how do you mark him? He's just, he's so unique. And even the way he kind of turns the hurl as well and, controls the ball he's just very he's just really really difficult to handle and his goal the other day it has to be it has to be that type of goal to be on Murphy it has to be that Garold Hegarty goal in the final almost. and he tripped to Tommy special. Walsh on the way in ran into Tommy Walsh pushed him over his leg I mean it's a total foul but players have been doing that for years in both codes but yeah you don't get blown for that forwards get away with what it, forwards can do whatever they want yeah and so uh, just bringing this up here, Tom Morris is getting. Let's not even bother wasting our time talking about it. Tom Morris is in there for sure. Tom Morris is definitely in. I, I place a, a hell of a lot of stock 
on the Limerick lads that pulled them through when a lot of the real marquee names maybe were struggling and Tom Morrissey was right up there. Definitely has to be there. Definitely okay. has to be right in there. D- does Tony Kelly get in here? Been honest, I I wouldn't have him in. Um, I don't I don't think it was his best year. I think he's had a lot better years uh, than this. He had a quiet semi final. He was brilliant against Dublin. I'm I'm not going to place that much stock on that that game. I know he got four points in the Munster yeah. final, but I thought, you know, if you were chatting to Tony Kelly after, I'd say he, he would have said I could have I should have had eight points in the Munster final. Two block down efforts, a couple of balls that dropped short, a couple of harmless enough kind of wides. Um, I don't. Um, no, no, I, I don't I, think so either. I, I don't think so. To be honest with you. Yeah, I'm just going to fill out a couple of other spots that are fairly obvious. Aaron Gallant, Owen Cody. I presume we're putting PJ Reid full forward. But yeah, putting... full, full forward or centre forward. And again, some some people might say, "Oh, you're saying Tony Kelly only got a point against Kilkenny. TJ Reid didn't score from play." But ah, I, I I think like if you look at the impact that. TJ had on the game against Clare, even win, winning a couple of frees, setting up the goal, probably should have had a goal himself, I'd say he's probably disappointed. Uh, Knocking over a sideline. Knocked over a sideline, do you know what I mean? I think he scored three from play in the Leinster final. Um, we're talking about how older players are managed now. I know he had a knock coming out of the all the all the Club campaign with Ballyhale, but it probably suits the like of TJ and Shane O'Donnell, who's had knocks in recent years, just to come, just to rock up for championship, really, doesn't it? Like when you have that kind of muscle memory in in, in the bank, I think it probably suits them just to rock up, keep them um, keep them fresh, and um, and I, I would, I I probably have. I'd probably have TJ Reid at 11, Shane, and I'd probably have Connor Whelan inside. And I think, yeah. you, have it. Yeah, I think you have it all done. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you read out the team there, and I count up how much there is for, for each team while you're yeah, at that. So we've all Murphy in the goals, Mikey Butler, two, Dan Morrissey, three, Hugh Lawler, four, Dermot Burns, five, John Condon, six, Kyle Hayes, seven, Dara Donovan, eight, Will O'Donoghue, nine, Shane O'Donnell, ten, TJ Reid, eleven, Tom Morrissey, twelve, Aaron Galan, thirteen. Connor Whelan, 14, and Owen Cody, 15. It's a fair team, I'll tell you that. Yeah, like the Kilkenny lads, I think that's five. So Murphy, Lawler, uh, TJ Reid, Owen Cody, and did I skip one there? I think I might have. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe it's only four. Um, Yeah, sorry. Murphy, Butler, Lawler, TJ Reid, and Owen Cody. Yeah, it is five. five then yeah. Limerick, Morrissey, Burns, Hayes, Darrow Donovan, Willow Donahue, Tom Morrissey, Aaron Galad, so that's seven for them. And then you've got one Galway and you've got uh, two Clare. So actually, like it's a nice little spread there. I wonder, will it be like that when it comes to the final? A couple of players that were, you know, maybe are unlucky or played themselves out. Dermot Ryan would have been in the conversation, I'd say, maybe before the semi final. He'd very, very, I think he was player of the month in May. Um, it's some great performance. It's just, it was kind of, Low percentage shots that he takes on, maybe over the shoulder, maybe cost him at, at times the other day. David Fitzgerald probably is unlucky as well. Depends, mm. it you know, if Will O'Donnell who plays the final centre back and has a really good uh performance, you could potentially be looking at him six. Maybe if it's David, David Fitzgerald would slot back into a midfield slot, maybe we'll see, we'll see in time. But uh, Seamus Flanagan's another one that's mentioned there. Um, Maybe he didn't shoot the lights out on the scoreboard the other day, but I thought he was brilliant even coming out to pitch. He played a different kind of a role in the second half the other day. Um, if he were to have a big final, I think he'd be really high in the conversation as well. Yeah, and I think like this is based up to now. We obviously know that the final could totally change what this team is, but I think, yeah, as as Hugh Wall says here, that's why they're the early All-Stars detox. Um, okay, we'll move on to a couple of other things that we wanted to talk about this week. And one of the first ones we wanted to do was talk about the most important players for each of the four teams left in the All-Ireland Football semi-finals. So with Kerry, is it as simple as saying it's David Clifford or is there anyone else who comes into the conversation, maybe the likes of, I don't know, Tyg Morley, if he isn't playing that sweeping role, can anyone else do it? Oh, I think there are definitely, this is not most valuable player. This is most important player. Um, I think there are definitely a couple of lads that come into the conversation. I like. If you look at Thomas Sullivan's role at cornerback, has there ever been a more higher score in cornerback? He offers something to Kerry that you know very few other players do. Is he their most important player? He's probably not. But good, very good point on Tyke Morley. He plays that role like nobody else probably can. And 
I'd say, you know, it, it'd be a fair headache for Jack O'Connor if Tyke Morley had to come off in the game. Who's going to play that role instead of him? And then the other point they made. What about Shawnee Shea? Shawnee Shea is obviously very, very important too. And if they didn't have him, like, like if they if they didn't have him, who's going to kick freeze? You know, from 45, 50 yards. Clifford's a very good free taker, obviously, but um, probably more off the left ball, whereas Shawnee can kick them uh, off the ground from basically anywhere, probably 60 yards in, you'd say. I'm actually going to go for their most important player being, uh, I'm going to go with someone like Dermot O'Connor, to be honest with you, because particularly if they're to get over Derry at the weekend, I think midfield is huge. He had a massive game uh, in the in the quarterfinal against Tyrone. I think they can, they can ill afford for midfield to not be getting something out of their midfield or something big out of them. And it's, it's great saying Clifford will shoot the lights out and he will if the ball comes in. But getting your hands on primary ball at midfield is huge. I'm actually going to go with Dermot O'Connor, middle of the field for Kerry. Um, and he's been threatening to he's been threatening to take over games in the last couple of years. You know the athleticism he has. He's a real kind of, if you look at you know, a typical AFL player, a player that would go over from Ireland to play AFL, it would probably be him. And I just think have a player like that on top form gives someone like Clifford the spring more that he needs. Potty Clifford, honourable mention as well. We talked about him earlier. When he's on form, he brings some amount of people into games. He might not shoot the lights out himself, but he brings some amount of the other forwards into the game. But I'm going to go with Dermot O'Connor. Yeah, I think it'd be just too easy to say David Clifford, even though he is the best player and, and you know, probably the best player in the country anyway. But I go with uh, Shawnee Shea there because I do think he comes up with the touch moments and those frees are absolutely huge, especially like last year's all in semi-final against Dublin. The height, the pressure, kick it into the hill where the wind can be swirling. I put him up there. Now, Derry, and I'm looking at the team sheet here from the quarterfinal and sort of analysing who do I think might be the, the main guy because there's an awful, an awful lot of guys you could look at. Um, and we'll probably talk about it a little bit more, but the fact that they've added a couple of long-range shooters, and I'm thinking, could Paul Cassidy be a really important player for them uh, at this stage of the year? But I don't think you can get away from Garrett McKinless, the centre-back, because how often does he come up and make that drive and run and either set up a goal or a massive score or get a point himself when it really matters? So I think he has to be right up there at the top of this conversation. Very good player. And he got a goal against Monaghan earlier on this year, I think, as well. I think yeah, he I did. think he did, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with someone in defence as well, actually. Um, I just think for all the, you know, Shane McGuigan maybe shooting the lights out and maybe Conor Glass. And Conor Glass is very high up in the conversation now mm. as regards importance. And Brendan Rogers will be as well. I just, I just, I just love watching Chrissy McCaig defend, and I just love look how he shut down, like you know, a, you know, a stellar list of some of the best forwards in the country. He's just been able to shut them down, and I put it this way: if he shuts down Clifford on Sunday, they're gonna, you'd have to say Derry are gonna have a massive chance. Now that's shutting down Clifford with the help of other lads who are going to be dropping around uh, and helping him too. But a lot of it is going to come down to man-on-man duel at different stages and whether he's able to limit Clifford's damage. So I'm going to go with Chrissy McCaig. Um, I just, I, yeah, I just, and I love, there was there's, there was some bits of camera kind of footage going around last year of him tracking, I think it was Conor McManus, just to see the mirror movement uh, and just to see how, we, how you know, the real elite cornerbacks operate at that level because it's uh, it's a fairly cutthroat game. If you're, if you're even a half step off, you're in big trouble, but uh, Chrissy McCaig will be for me for Derry. Yeah, then Dublin, and I just I thought the impact of Carmel Costello the last day, like he was really really important in their performance. Colin Baskell now he's after bringing a little something different because you know that the the main markers are going to be on the likes of Costello, Cano Callahan, and Kieran Kilkenny, assuming he's fit. But Baskell has brought a bit of dynamism and pace and finishing ability that I think might make him hugely important because. We often see this in, in big games that the main men end up being shut down because they're targeted by the opposition's main shutdown merchants. So maybe it could be someone like Pascal. Well, is he top scorer from playing this year's championship? I think he I think he is. Or he's sure he is, he's yeah. right up there. Um like as regards importance, they're crying out for like a new face to really kind of take on maybe some of that scoring load, and he definitely has. I I, I could not look beyond James McCarthy here though. Um, to me, he's just the heartbeat of the team. Um, like he was the one, he was probably one of the ones really taking it to Mayo in that second half. Actually, had a quite a first half, 
but he's just he is integral to everything that that Dublin do and particularly when they're more well he's usually more than well be it center back wing back or midfield um I yeah I just, whenever he steps aside it'll be a sad day for for football and definitely all for all the Dublin football faithful will be James McCarthy for me and he can still control games despite the fact like he started he started every final he's the only one that started every final uh well Cluxton has now as well he's still around now or he's back on the scene now as well but um yeah I'm gonna go with James McCarthy. And then with Monaghan, and I agree with James McCarty, but Manze for, for Monaghan, Conor McMahon, is, <laughs> he's just so clutch. M- Manze. Um, <laughs> well, like, he's not starting games, but look at what he's doing off the bench. Like, look at what he's doing. Even he was just so ice cool for the two penalties and extra time the last day as well. And he was just hoping and wishing that he's not the one that misses or puts him out of championship, but what maybe could be his last game. Uh, he's been crucially important. Conor McCarthy's been brilliant uh, at wing back as well. I'm actually going to go with uh, the other wing back, uh, Carl O'Connell, who's 35. I think he's been re energised this year. I remember watching the Tyrone game, just some of the plays he was making. He he has, he still ha- he has, doesn't seem to have lost um, even a yard of pace. He would have been a really good athlete back in the day. He only took up football at 17, actually, even like club football. And look at where kind of where he is now. I think he's in pole position for an all star. And he just makes some of those lung busting runs that get them on the front foot, create a score for him or create a score for others. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with Carol O'Connell. Yeah, and I was actually thinking. Gary Mohan's uh, involvement the last day was huge. He scored three points. He made a great save. Uh, somebody had a goal opportunity. I can't remember off the top of my head who it was, but he stopped a, a goal opportunity at one stage. And after missing the first penalty, he came back and, and scored a second one to finish the shootout. So uh, he'd be in the conversation, but for me, it's it's Manzi all day. Is there anything um, in terms of the two football semifinals that, um, like, that really strikes you as something that's important to... I know the tactics or the winning and losing of the game. Like for me, Derry against Kerry and knowing how Derry like to isolate an attacker when they're in the defence because all teams drop all 15 back. And they've done it to, Michael Murphy talked about how it was done to him before Brendan Rodgers running at him when Derry had the ball up the field and they're so good and methodical and working it around until they isolate an attacker to run at him. And this was probably the reason that Conor McManus ended up no longer starting for Monaghan is that Conor McCluskey was able to isolate him, run at him and score a goal. So, like, is David Clifford going to allow himself to be brought back into defence and do that? Or is Clifford just going to go, do you know what, I'm parking myself up the square if you want to leave me on, on my own? Well done to you. I think, uh, I think the latter, to be honest with you. Because I just think he's too dangerous. To, like, you could leave a lot of other players by themselves. You wouldn't leave Clifford. Um, you just couldn't leave Clifford. And I just don't think, um, I don't think Jack O'Connor will want him anywhere inside his own 65 and I think he'd be happy like generally like if they're playing 14 men behind the ball it's always Clifford that's up it you know I, I don't I don't see themselves um allowing Clifford to be dragged into that sort of scenario where he's going to expend a load of energy listen David Clifford is the exception to nearly all rules in Gaelic football now at the moment everybody has to be able to track back there's like there's no um preferential treatment for any players now basically accept him you have like he's just too dangerous up top you just i would say you leave him up there um at all times you let somebody you pass mccluskey or you pass if he's marking christy mccaig now christy mccaig i doubt will try and put him on the front foot at, at 34 and he can do it i've seen him do it with dear mcconley before in not learning club semi-final and i think he kicked a couple of points off him from center back but that's generally not his role with Derry, and it would like if McCaig picks him up, I don't think McCaig are going to be trying to put him on the back foot. Um, I don't know if that would play to his strengths at this stage of the day. But um, no, I don't see I don't see Clifford veering uh, any further back than his own sixty five really at, at any times. Maybe he might be the top man just as Derry are going laterally. But I just don't. Uh, Kerry will want to play to his strengths and play to their strengths, and that's Clifford up top and remaining up top and doing damage on the scoreboard. Be interesting though if Derry start to punch holes, will Kerry be like, Well, look, we need the extra man to go back in there, and they'll be patient enough to see if they can exploit a little bit of a gap in defense. But yeah, I think it's unlikely to go back there. Like the midfield area now is very interesting. Connor Glass and Brendan Rogers are two of the best 
easily all-star material, both of them. But Dermot O'Connor was brilliant the last day. Uh, Jack Barry's a bit of a work, workhorse. So I want to see a lot of kickouts going out between a lot of them. I'm sure most of them, or an awful lot of them, will be very short. But um, that'll be interesting. Like The other thing that I think where Derry have evolved from last year is, do you remember against Galway in the All-Ireland semi-final, the amount of times that Derry players passed up, passed up the opportunity to shoot around the D or 30 yards out and Oran Lynch, their goalkeeper, ended up taking on a lot of the shots. It seemed to me like they were reluctant shooters. Whereas now, I think, because Rodgers is more up the field, and obviously he could score from fullback anyway, but you've got him, you've got Conor Glass, they're happy to shoot from distance. Eaton Doherty's getting more scores, as far as I can see, and Paul Cassidy and, and Shane McGuigan still. They've probably evolved a nice bit, so let's see if Kerry can deal with that. They've had to. It's kind of like um, what the Donegal kick in... 2011 was it six points? Was they end up eight six? Eight six. Yeah. Uh, Derry hit one six last year in their all Ireland semi final. I think Donegal um, realised that they had to evolve in twelve. They did. I think they won all Ireland kicking something like was it two thirteen to fourteen points. I think Derry have evolved as well. They're yeah, you know what they're putting on the scoreboard is generally a lot higher, a lot more consistent than it would have been last year. Different stages. Now, they haven't really done it in Crow Park, and that's probably the, the, probably a question. And even when they played Dublin in the Division 2 final later on this year, they didn't really deliver much of a performance. You can see it, I think, four goals that day as well. Interesting aside, actually, if you look at the goals conceded in this championship um, for the four teams that were left. So Kerry have conceded one goal in six games, albeit with a soft enough um, Munster championship. I think that was the goal against... Uh, that was... Was it James Carr that got the goal when they played Mayo uh, in the qualifier? I can't fully remember. Um, but they've conceded one goal in six games. Dublin have conceded two and seven. Monaghan have conceded three and seven. And Derry have actually conceded six and seven, which is like you'd have them down as the most defensive team. So that kind of maybe that shows that they've the shackles have been taken off somewhat and they realise that they need to speculate to accumulate and to put up big scores. So maybe going to have to concede one or two at the other end. But like, What's the score going to be if Derry are going to be really competitive in this game? Like, are we look at like what are we looking at, one twelve to thirteen or something like that. Is that kind of what you're thinking? A miserable old scoreline. A bit, a, maybe a wet day would be handy as well. Yeah, but well, you know what? Let's play a little bit of a clip, uh, a clip of Poacher and Varley chatting about it last night. You can get the full video on the our game, uh, our game that I. Are you going? Are you going? Are you going on record saying that Derry are going to edge this? Yeah. I think there. I think Derry. I think I have a. I have a feel. I just have a feeling. I just have a feeling from the word go this year. I said to you, I've just been very impressed with with how they've made the transition from from uh, you know losing Gallagher to to Kiermina taking over. I just I'm so impressed with with how that's gone so smoothly. I'm just so impressed with how comfortable they were against Cork. You know, they were never really in danger, bar the goal from Cork, where there was a little bit of a hooray for a minute, but Derry would stood down the field and, and, and scored instantly. And I just I just been so impressed with them and, uh, and and particularly their development from last year. I think they're a mature group. They've won back to back Ulster titles. Yes, they didn't get over the line against Dublin in the Division Two final, but they'll have learned a lot. And don't forget that day, Christy McCaig was injured that day. Uh, Owen McAvoy was injured that day and Connor Glass went off an injury that day you know three critical key men for them so I just wouldn't be I just wouldn't be reading an awful lot into that result either so look I, as I say it's it's. <laughs> if I, I will I will say though Stevie I will say if Kerry if Kerry get ahead to get ahead by three four points this game this game, I'm not going to say it's finished, but if Derry get behind it all, if as you said there, if they make it attritional for the first 55, 60 minutes and it's even pagan going in the last 10 minutes, well then you'd have to, you know what, you'd nearly give Derry the edge here. But if Kerry get ahead here, the floodgates could open like last year, like, like all the way. Like. That's, that's, I'm not saying, no, look, at they're, they're another year for sure. A hundred percent. Listen, you know, the whole part of Derry's thing is that, Derry system and the way they play, yeah, it, it, it can be it can be a struggle to really chase a game. You know, it can be a yeah. struggle to chase a game. So, you know, now they did chase elements of of certain games throughout the year, and and you know they they they, they did manage to do that. Like, but th this is a different animal they're playing on Sunday. Obviously, uh, you know, it's 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 a Kerry who are maybe 
who are maybe now got the stage where they were hurting before the Tyrone game. They've got they've come through the Tyrone game. They've had two weeks now of, of really honing in on Derry, really focusing in. Paddy Talley again having his knowledge, uh, you yeah. know, of of Derry and, yeah. and, and and Ulster football. Obviously, it's a huge advantage, and it's a huge advantage. You know, to have that knowledge is is a huge advantage. You know, when you when when you're when you're you know so close to a group like that. But no, listen, I I I'm still. I'm still edging towards, you know, a, a narrow Derry victory. And I, I'm sort of maybe out of hope, like, because I'd love to see something different. You know, uh, Kerry oh. and Dublin have contested so many All-Ireland finals. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure it'll be another fantastic final, but it would love to be, I would love to see something different. I would love to see. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, that clip stops there at that point. But um, yeah, he's, is there an element that a lot of people want to see a different final? Uh, I want to see Dublin Kerry come on. <laughs> I'm the same. Um, I watch Dublin Kerry every day of the week. If it was on every day of the week, to be but honest, but I still think Derry against Dublin would be quite uh, intriguing. Yeah, not for you. Not it, for int- you. It, no, int- intriguing. Yes, but Dublin Kerry is just you just know how free flowing it's going to be. How many different things you're going to have to have eyes in the back of your head to see what's going on with different things, and you just the matchups will be fascinating. Um, I do think uh, Ender's point on if Kerry get ahead. If Kerry get three or four ahead, Derry, the way, Derry style does not is not conducive to chasing the game. It's a fr- it's kind of a front running style, so it's so key that you know Kerry don't get an early goal or something like that, or have a little bit of a buffer because Derry have to take the shackles off when they're chasing a the game, and Kerry there's a the potential for Kerry to cut loose if that does happen. But no, I I I I be I be all for uh, a Dublin Kerry final. Been honest with you and. Mm. As much as you'd like to see maybe Monaghan make a breakthrough and Derry maybe break make a breakthrough, but be honest with you, that that final would not enthuse me very very much. Now I have to say, yeah, Dublin are seven to one on in a lot of places, so people are expecting them to to win this game. And to be honest, when it's seven to one on, win it pulling up or certainly at arm's length throughout the most of the game, Monaghan are going to probably have to play their greatest ever game to win this one, especially against a team that's so used to. To getting it done at this stage of a competition, albeit you know we, we'll take into context that they've lost the last two semi-finals, but in injury time of one of them against Kerry last year, they were level after a very poor start to the game, and the year before they were eleven points to four ahead or ten four ahead against uh, Mayo at half time, had the game in their hands, and ultimately it kind of slipped away in extra time, and certainly at the latter stages of normal time. So it's not like they've kind of gone a mile off the boil here; they are used to this stage of the competition. Uh, I think it is interesting what Mana and the part of their backroom team is the former director general of the GEA, Parik Duffy. Apparently, you know, just a brilliant administrator and details man over the years, so no harm there. But just on that won't... as well, like, you like, have Parik Duffy as part of the, the Mana and backroom team, and you have Pat Gilroy as part of the, the Dublin backroom team. Like, the ab- backroom teams now are absolutely stacked. The caliber of individual at inter county level is just, it's outstanding, really. Like, even the fact that, like, you know, Kerry at Paddy Talley coming all the way down from Tyrone to be involved in their backroom team and look how how uh, how much how an important of a back a backroom team member he is and even Tony Griffin in there as well like you just pull from all sorts of different fields now but uh, really really high class individuals involved there I think that the the there or the Dublin Monaghan that's not a rivalry because they haven't played that much in championship but they have an interest in history remember when Pat Gilroy took over the dubs he used to just go over to, go up to Monaghan nearly on a weekly basis and it was basically they played challenge games against each other and it's a long standing thing they play every year but they played each other seven or eight times one year and it was just literally to road test a load of lads I think he played Clucks and Corner forward one day and it was basically just kind of Test his metal. This is what Gilroy did to kind of harden up the dubs and eventually get them take tough enough that they eventually won All Ireland. So there's an interesting kind of relationship between the two counties. Mm, certainly, uh, but I think most people expect Dublin to come through in that game. And look, I, I actually am. I'm, I'm not. I'm starting to think that Derry have a decent chance in this other game against Kerry. Now, at the same time, I feel like I'm always sort of questioning Kerry, and you know, do they have the metal for the big games? And they like the way they came through that Tyrone game, albeit Tyrone weren't brilliant, but Kerry made them look poor. And you would have thought if anyone's going to give them a physical challenge, it is them. So you have to give them credit. But I do kind of feel like Derry are going to push them all the way. But I suppose with the shooting power of the of Clifford and, and so on and so forth, I'd probably have to go with Kerry there. Would you be similar? No, you'd be definitely thinking it's going to be the title of the two semi-finals anyway. Um, 
and listen, you, you want to, hopefully both teams are taken down the stretch and they're interesting games. But if you're looking at which is going to be more of an arm wrestle, Derry could pose some pretty tough questions for Kerry, uh, particularly if they get off to a decent start and they're able to, it's, you know, there's only a point or two between them, particularly coming down the home stretch. But yeah, it, it's definitely far from, um, like if you're going to say there's going to be an upset in either semi-final, I'd be leaning so strongly towards Derry potentially upsetting Kerry. I just cannot see Monaghan beating beating Dublin, being honest with you. You have a team who scored 12 points after, what, 75 minutes against Armagh. Um, no goal, obviously, coming up against a team that Cluxton hasn't conceded a goal in his last 12 games for Dublin, I think. And you're just thinking Dublin could potentially cut loose at different stages. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was a, a seven or eight point win for Dubs, maybe minimum. Uh, whereas Kerry... Derry could be really tight and it could, might only be three or four in it. I still expect Kerry to come through, though. Um, is there any quiz? We have a little, a, li- a little bit of a quiz. Uh, Daryl Flynn, who helped us out with the with the show and researching and stuff, actually sent me on a few questions yesterday. He said, in case you're under pressure, lad, here's a few questions for the quiz. So they're, co- they're coming in very, very handy. Um, these are... Um, and it's an eclectic uh, trio of questions. There's no particular pattern to them. No so, rhyme or reason. I love no it. No rhyme or reason. First one is, who were the last team to beat Bally Gunner in the Waterford Senior Hurling Championship? When was it and at what stage? One second. What did I call? Okay. So, who were the last team to beat Bally Gunner in the Waterford Senior Hurling Championship? When was it and at what stage? So just to let you know, they've won 48 championship games uh, in succession since then, which okay. is uh, which which is fairly outstanding. This is a diff- this is a, this is a difficult one. If you can get within a year or two, I, I'll give you the answer to this one. When was the last time uh, Galway, Kilkenny, or Cork did not compete in an All Ireland Camogie final? Galway, Kilkenny, or Cork? Yeah. When was the last time? Galway, Kilkenny, or Cork did not compete in an All Ireland Camogie final. Okay, well, with that one, I'm going to say like Tipperary won five in six years. I think 04 was the last of them. Maybe it had to be one of those years. But anyway, we'll come back to that. We'll let we'll you come ask. back to that. And the last one is also a Camogie question, but it's a bit more recent. Uh, who was the last team that wasn't Galway, Cork, or Kilkenny to win an All Ireland Camogie title, senior Camogie title? That wasn't one of the three of them. Yeah. Who was the last team that wasn't Galway, Cork and Kilkenny to win the All-Ireland Camogie title? Okay, so the first question, will I come back to that? Uh, yes, who were the last team to beat Bally Gunner in the Walford Senior Hurling Championship? When was it and at what stage? Passage? Yes. 2013? Yes. Semi-final? County final. Oh, I was, I'd written down final first and then I thought, no. It they, got, they got a heap of goals. Um, they got a heap of goals and... It was the worst thing they ever did. They got they had their day in the sun, but Pally Gunner have exacted revenge several times since. I don't think he'll be within an ass's roar of the next one. When was the last time Galway, Kilkenny or Cork did not compete in an All-Ireland Camogie final? Oh, I had written down 2004. 1984. <laughs> when Dublin beat Tip 5-9-2-4. It's amazing to think that the three of them have been in the last, what, 39 finals before then. Amazing, yeah. really. Mm. And the last one is, uh, and I'm going to add a caveat to this. Who was the last team that wasn't Galway, Cork and Kilkenny to win an All-Ireland Camogie title? And when was it? I, I'm actually drawing a bit of a blank here and I'm trying to think what other counties might have won it. Maybe Offaly is, is you know, on my mind. No, uh, off, no your, your mind's off. Offaly were junior and intermediate around this time. Tip 04? Wexford 2012. Oh, Jesus Christ almighty. Yeah. Course, and were, I think that, over was that four in a row, I think? It could have it, been. It was three or four in a row. Was JJ Doyle over the team? JJ Doyle was over the team, yeah. The Mag Darcy and Kay Kelly, uh, Ursula Jacob, etc. So, yeah. Passage 2013 County Final. 1984 was the last time Galway and Kenny or Cork didn't compete in the All-Ireland Final. And Wexford... 2012. They were tricky now. Fairness that, to Dara. That was they, a they, horrible they, quiz. The last, the last two were particularly tricky. Yeah, Richard Hogan says Shane will be testing Bernie for Galway in a few weeks. Is that all right, Mick? Yeah, that's. I wouldn't be now. My not as a Galway now wouldn't be uh, as strong as Cheltenham. But listen, I'm 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 always up for a challenge. I just I hope you're getting your Kilkenny jersey dusted off 
you have to have it dusted off. If they win the Sunday week, you're going to the Tipperary County Final or in the Kilkenny Colours. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. I never thought I'd have to worry about that. Speaking of Kilkenny, they're in the All-Ireland Junior Football Championship semi-finals this weekend. They're meeting London and Abbottstown. Uh, New York are going to be uh, up against uh, Warwickshire. That's part of a double header. Uh, the Talton Cup Final as well. You were talking about speaking about Colm O'Rourke heading into this. Down against Mead. So both teams, when they got knocked out of the Sam Maguire Cup, Everton was negative, you know, Everton's wrong, the two teams are a disaster, all that kind of stuff. But this is a chance to put a real gloss on the year. Yeah, now I don't know if they were saying that about Down as much as, as me. Down underperformed against Armagh, but they showed glimpses of maybe what, what they could do. Remember, like Down were like very, very low last year. All sorts of problems, managerial problems. Um, they weren't delivering on the pitch. A hell of a lot of their best personnel not involved in the squad. There were signs of green shoots. Like outside of Mead's first two league games this year, there were not signs of green shoots. Like they were under pressure. They were nearly relegated from Division 2 as well. Then Offaly beat them in the championship. If you look at how that form worked out, yeah, Offaly put up against Loud, but Offaly capitulated in the, the Talchon Cup since. Fairness to Mead, um, they've kept, I think, largely the same personnel on board and they've won their five games in the Talchon Cup, three group games, a quarter final and semi final. And they've beaten down along the way. They beat them one eleven to one nine. Conor O'Rourke was kind of saying yesterday that that they weren't being naive or innocent uh, in how they were defending. It was just three or four new faces in defence, and there was always going to be some teething problems and take time for you know a defensive structure to cement uh, to cement in. But uh, major actually outsiders going into this based on down uh, bagging the eight goals against me against uh, Leash in the semi final. And th- listen, I think the fact that these two played was what 32 years ago in the 1991 uh, All Ireland final. O'Rourke was obviously uh, playing that day, he could only come on. I think he had pneumonia. Um, in the I actually did a video with him last year talking about that, so you can find that if you type in Colm O'Rourke, you can definitely find it. Like he was writing columns for the newspaper heading into these big All Ireland finals <laughs> at the time. For the Smart, Sunday. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. he um. He did a fitness test with Sean Boylan the day before in Park Talchon and he was physically incapable of running. Um, and then 24 hours later, adrenaline or whatever kicked in. He came in, I think he came in around the 43rd minute, nearly had turned the tide. Um, but maybe this, he said it was one that he always felt got away from. Him. Maybe he'll exact a bit of revenge 32 years later. Um, I don't think Down are going to pierce holes through the mid defence, maybe like they did against Leash. Um, to be fair, though, they're a pro park team, though. Like to me, they just have so many silky, classy forwards, and they pace everywhere. I'd give them a decent chance here. Yeah, Richard Hogan says there as well. Down have a great record of finals in Crow Park. They have an outstanding record of finals. Um, I just have a, I have a, I have a sneaky feeling Mead might deliver something here in this final. Um, they've been consistent since they were beaten. It's also the big carrot of like down their Division Three team. They will compete in the Sam Maguire next year, regardless of how their league goes next year. Same with Mead, even if they were relegated from Division 2 next year, they'd compete in the Sam Maguire. So it is a fair carrot. I'm just wondering as well, as regards when you compare it to the to the Joe McDonough, like is this a much better is this a much better reward in the sense that next year is the reward? It's something that you can build towards rather than the reward being you're playing. Uh, Offaly are playing Tipperary in three weeks or Carlo are playing Dublin in three weeks is this like is thinking mm. about it in a longer scale is this players won't go on the beer after this match do you know they want, to, like, yeah. they've had a long tough season and like it's better for them than rather than let's say the Talchon Cup was played off and it was done by early June and then that team is parachuted straight into the All-Ireland Championship they wouldn't have had that extra month or six weeks or whatever you want to say to sort of build uh let's say a month or six weeks, is really going to stand to them next year, irrespective of whether they win the final or not. So I think well, that's, yeah. that that's us an award, a reward. Well, look at it as well. Westmead knew they were playing Sam Maguire this year. They weren't they weren't great in Leinster. They were beaten by Loud. But look at their performances in the All-Ireland series. Like Westmead should have been true. Should have been true. Realistically, should have made a preliminary quarterfinal. And I think maybe that's partly due to the fact that at the start of their year or at the end of last year, they knew they were going to be in this competition. That was yeah. their that was their end goal, peak in June, early July, hopefully. And they put up some massive performances, albeit fall up a small and short. So there's a, yeah, there's a fair carrot there for the winner, you'd have to say. Yeah, and then we'll just go through the fixtures for the ladies' football quarterfinals this weekend. Kerry against Mead, Armagh against Cork, 
Cor- Galway against Mayo and Donegal against Dublin. I just wonder what are your thoughts in terms of um, what's going on with the the players not speaking to the media this week and well, sorry, they're not speak. I'll just get the the email here. So uh, this is a, G- a GPA media update. Intercounty female players have decided not to take part in media events organised by the LGFA or Camogie Association in advance of games in the closing stages of the All Ireland Championships. The decision was taken collectively on a call of squad reps and captains yesterday. This was uh, referring to Tuesday, as the hashtag Unite for Equality protest continues. To avoid a loss of coverage of the games, the GPA will organise media access to players. We will be in touch in the next 24 to 48 hours with details. Players' decisions will have no impact on local arrangements that regional media have in place. So, again, I just think the GPA are using players as pawns to just get, kind of get their own ideas across and so on and so forth. If you're being realistic, right, it is very difficult for both women's associations to get any media coverage. Let's call a spade a spade. Both associations, and I think this has been a very positive step over the recent years, they actually produce articles and interviews that they then yeah. send to all the media outlets who are very stretched with resources in the first place. It's not simply a case of, all oh, the media aren't interested in covering women's sports. But if we call a spade a spade, far more media is consumed. Like if we put out something, some content that's to do with women's sport versus men's sport in Gaelic games, the men's sport will be watched many multiple times over. If you're to look at the analytics of the videos that are watched on the, on the YouTube channel here, it's well over 95% are males watching the sport. So, I mean, look, a lot of it comes down to are women supporting women enough in sports as well? Like you go to a local GA game, Burr, at the weekend, there'll be plenty of young girls there as well as young boys. But then if the Burr ladies are playing, I don't know if there'll be as many of either there. But anyway, coming back to it, it's very difficult to get the message across in the first place. Like I was at the quarterfinals of the Camogie the other day and there was almost nobody in the stadium when these uh, protests were being made before the start of the game. So I don't know, what do you make of this? Where is it going? Is it making an impact? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's, uh, as you said there, coverage is so thin at the moment. I think you're taking more coverage off the table here, I think, to be honest with you, or the potential for more coverage. I know they're saying they're going to organise whatever. Um, that kind of r- remains, to be, remains to be seen, really. Um, I think they're trying to fast-track something that's going to take time. Um, I think you will eventually probably get to a point where um, where men and ladies' teams are being, you know, they're equal access to whatever. But I think it's going to take time. I think, and like, the organisations aren't even under the one umbrella yet. You yeah, know, these things these things are gonna take it's gonna take a bit of time um for it to, to all play out really. Um I don't know, I think they might be shooting themselves in the foot with the with the lack of media or whatever. As you said there, the Camogie provided a, a media service, the LGFA provided a media service. Um so our so play, play our content now in the next few weeks. So the yeah. both of those associations send us uh content all the time. So who's now going to do that content? Yeah, I don't know, um, and I don't know whether the managers aren't going to talk to the LGFA, the Camogie system. They're probably not going to, I'd say. Maybe, um, to be honest with you, you might have, uh, this is often the way, you might have, uh, maybe ignorance is the wrong word to use, but you might have someone who said, I'll talk to you, no problem, or whatever, anyway, and they won't maybe pay too much attention to what's going on. Like, remember when um, the uh, the G, the GPA and the players were striking over... Was it the mileage allowance uh, maybe 18 months ago or something like mm. that that hadn't come back in place to pre-COVID levels? Some managers would still talk after. Like, there was there was no panic. Maybe other, others wouldn't. Um, but it's just, uh, I, I don't know. I think they need every bit of coverage that they can get at the moment. It just there's a couple of interests in the sides. Uh, Mead are playing at 3 o'clock in Crow Park. Uh, Paul Garrigan and Eugene Ivers are both involved there with the, the men's the men's team. They're actually both involved now. I think it's the, it's the two of them that are both involved with the women's team now as well under Jenny Rispin, who played down in Tralee, I think, at half seven that evening. So that's going to pose a few problems for them in that quarter final. And you'd have to say, even though Mead are reigning champions in the football, Kerry are favourites in that game. And Kerry looked like the potentially the dominant team uh, at senior level ladies football. But they're four interesting quarter finals this weekend. Yeah, we've lots of like fixture clashes and nightmares for CCCs coming up. Like next weekend, Tipperary are in the All Ireland Camogie semi final. 
in both the intermediate and senior, which is on the Sunday. So you're having, I think it's like half one and maybe four o'clock throw and something like that anyway, give or take. But there's a lot of fixtures in Tipperary, in club, in the, in the divisions at the moment as well. Some, will, some of them will be on the Saturday, but then inevitably you're going to have some of them on the Sunday. And it's almost a nightmare though. Like what can you do? Because there's still probably this um, legacy of not having games early in the, in the day on a Saturday because of people, you know, traditionally working that hour. And you can't put every game on Saturday evening. And even like, it's it's very harsh on players to have them playing on a Sunday evening. You know, you'd often see that happening. Does that happen an awfully as well that you might have yeah, a six o'clock throw in on a Sunday? does from time. Like that's the worst of the worst. Waiting yeah. all weekend for a fixture. And then realistically, you want to go out and enjoy yourself after a championship game and spend a bit of time with the, the boys or whatever. And then you have to feel the effects of it on Monday and your work probably suffers as a result of it. But that's the worst of the worst. I think most people would prefer to play probably on a Friday evening, um, maybe Saturday, Saturday lunchtime, Saturday four o'clock, something like that. There's nothing worse. Than, I The only thing worse maybe than a Sunday six o'clock is I always hate playing championship games on Sunday at 12 I don't know. It's something just weird about. I, I I don't think championship games should be played really at, at that hour. I think it shouldn't be played before two o'clock realistically. And it's not because they suffer from a sticky mattress. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sunday. I I played a lot of league games over the years. Sunday at eleven o'clock in the morning. Uh, That's all. League bad. games not too bad. No. Game, different story. No. Number one. During that time of the year, Saturday nights are there to be enjoyed. So you don't want to have to get up that early on a Sunday morning. Never mind trying to be right that hour on a mm. Sunday morning. And I could just, you know, I can nearly picture the body language of going into one of these league games, you know, in some old dirty old club pitch somewhere and you have to go through <laughs> the motions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, Richard Hogan points out, bank holiday Monday evening. That is, that is cruel. Why aren't, like, why aren't there more clubs? Like in Dublin, any night of the week, you could be playing championship. Now, it's not really traditionally a Monday or a Tuesday, but because there's so many games in both codes, like it's very uh, common to have Wednesday games. It's very common to have Friday, Saturday, Sunday games. I just don't understand why this isn't more of a culture all across the board and even at inter-county level now when neighbouring counties are playing each other. Why not have a televised Friday night game? It would be absolutely brilliant and everyone would be watching. Yeah, no, I think that would be brilliant, yeah. And I think it's as long as you give them plenty of notice uh, with work and stuff like that, there's, there's no issue. Um, as regard championship games, I think having championship games, you know, potentially on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, is probably easier in Dublin from the respect of whoever's playing with those clubs are living in Dublin. But it can take... It can take no, well, look, the reason I'd, I'd go against that is it would take me longer to get, uh, get from my house in Balls Bridge to Parnell Park It'd probably take longer to do that than it would take me to get from Nina to Turles. Really? Okay, okay. Yeah. But I just, just just saying, what, what I was saying was kind of if um if I'm based up here in Mead and I have to come down for a game on a Wednesday night, that's very, very difficult. Mm. Because you're going to be probably in your car for the good of about two hours. But um But well, there's some pilot behind the wheel though, to be fair to you. <laughs> yeah. I have to stop two or three times where the body seizes up. Um, I remember awfully played Limerick in a qualifier on Thursday in Thurles, and it was a right crowd there. Mm. And I, no, I, no, I three think, or something, was it? Uh, oh, three or four. Mike Mack was mm. over awfully. Um, and I do think they probably need to look at some more avenues to open up time because a lot of the time now, with the amount of games that are on on the weekend now, Saturday and Sunday are rammed, and a lot of fixtures aren't getting maybe as much coverage as it should be. We probably need to try and buy ourselves a little bit more time in that regard. Yeah. Now, so obviously you you've kind of pointed out a few times now that if Kilkenny win the All Ireland, based on our long-standing bet, I have to wear a Kilkenny jersey to the Tipperary Hurling County Final. Will you at least come? Al- you have to come along as well. At least sit there beside me, give me a bit of an emotional support. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me to do something. Um, I'll give you a bit of emotional support. I'll go around uh, like a megaphone like the boys that they have when they're canvassing for votes or something like that. <laughs> and I just make sure, make sure everybody is aware of you, maybe. Yeah, well, look, the, the main thing is I can't be sitting there like, like a clown on my own. Well, if you wear those colours in, I'd say there's a fair chance you will be sitting by yourself. 
Yeah, but at least if they see you there beside me, they might, like a lot of people, uh, plenty of people. In I'd be like this, I'd be just like, look at this, Egypt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's it from the show today. A reminder brought to you by rstore.ie, the official home of merchandise here. If you want to get a club fundraiser, and we have one coming very soon, but uh, email events at rgame.ie. It's a great way to do it. Also, coaching clinics, which we'll bring them back pretty soon as well. Are you looking forward to that, uh, that fundraiser we're doing next week? Yeah, we're down in O'Loughlin Gales uh, next Thursday night, just firming up all the details at the moment, uh, doing a big All-Ireland final preview. Uh, some big names are going to be there, some big local legends as well. Uh, should be a cracking night. Looking forward to the All-Ireland final, yeah. Yeah, OK, that's it. We'll see you all again on Monday. Thanks very much, Michael. Chat to you soon. Cheers, Jeno.